Guys, I click go live today. Also, happy Earth Day. <laughs> this might not be the best <laughs> day for... <laughs> okay, I'll be honest. I didn't have anything planned for Earth Day. And you know what that means? I hate nature. Nah, nature is chill. It's just, it's getting too hot. It's literally like 60 degrees out right now in Washington. Washington. We're supposed to be getting rain. Like, what's going on? Oh no, I gotta sneeze. Okay, we good. I'm muted for, like, your guys' sake. Also, the VOD watchers, because there is no background music in the VOD, so... The music would not have drowned out my sneeze. Base cam on in one minute. Okay, three, two, one. Yo. The blue is different. I hate it. Why'd they update it? I noticed it this morning and I was like, ew. But Hello, good morning. Good afternoon. It is eleven fifteen AM. Wait, we missed eleven eleven. Like we just missed it. That's my fault for not telling you guys. But good morning. Hope you guys are doing well. It is Monday. April twenty second. It is Earth Day. And we're not doing Earth Day things today, mainly because I forgot. And the plan was for Earth Day was to like plant little potted plants. But then I was like, if I do that, I'm not going to take care of them. So I'm just like being honest. I hate plants. I have only one plant in my room and it's an aloe plant. And it's like this tall and I've had it for like four years and I forget to water it, but she's really strong and resilient. So she hasn't died yet. I ever buy my TV. So that way, when I look at my TV, I see the plant and it makes me happy. Yeah. So I think the last time I streamed was Friday. Oh yeah, we did Mario Kart. We did a short Mario Kart stream on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. I hung up with my favorite friends. So that's what I was doing. And then also yesterday evening, Sunday, I spent like six hours editing. I have, um, what you call it? I have like a month and a half's worth of clips and YouTube shorts. So that's good. I'm all caught up on that. And then I just got to work on main channel edits. I think 
I might edit this stream to be uploaded this Saturday. We'll see. It depends on how long the VOD is because, you know, I've been getting lazy. I have a list of streams that I need to edit. I have like 10 for the main channel that I got to work on. But I'm always doing the ones that are like the least amount of time. Because <laughs> like, if anybody edits, like, you know that the time in which it takes to trim and like edit, just doing that. Like, takes nearly two to three times the length of the raw footage. So, you know, I'm looking at my list of things to edit, and I'm like, man, that two-hour VOD is looking good. I don't want to touch the six-hour one, you know? But yeah, so that's what I did yesterday. And also, I logged into Crumble this morning. And I don't know if this is, like, a local thing or if it's a nationwide thing, but they're offering, like, the mini cookies normally, but only on Mondays. They know. It's probably because people tried to like skirt the rules and order catering last second. They probably didn't want to deal with that. So now they're offering mini cookies on Mondays. But there was no no cookies this week. So I'm not getting it. I don't need it. Plus my birthday's on Wednesday. And you can get a free cookie on your birthday, allegedly. So I might get it on Wednesday. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking. Talking about my birthday, yes. My birthday is this Wednesday, April 24th. I'm going to be turning 25 this year. So, just like last year, we're going to be doing another 12-hour stream. So, live from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. But this year, because I think my first birthday stream, we just played Kirby and that was it. Kind of a, a lame stream, IMO. And then last year, last year I did activities and then games. So, it was better but like still kind of like mid so this year i'm gonna be doing all the things that a 25 year old should be doing and i'm not gonna say you guys just have to watch so that'll be this wednesday starting at 10 a.m ending at 10 p.m there is no like it's not a subathon so there's no cap like once i hit 12 hours i'm done <laughs> yeah because i usually do the subathon for my stream anniversary, which is August. And then I might do a cycle subathon this year in September. I'm debating. I'm debating still. Like, I need to get my strength up, you know? Oh, this music's nice. What's this one? KSSO. Casino Monopoly 2. Gambling! Uh-oh. Okay. So. Today. The music is really loud. It's not going to be here for the VOD watchers, so they don't got to worry, but it's okay. I keep looking to my left because that's where my phone is. Okay. So, the music is so loud for me. Why is it so loud? Yeah, my music volume is at like 10. Why is it so freaking loud? Okay. I need to get ready. Okay, so as you can tell by the title, today we are taking the R-A-A-D-S-R questionnaire. It's not a test, it's a questionnaire. It's used as a tool to like pre-screen people to see if they have ASD or Autism Spectrum Disorder. And that can mean autism or ADHD or ADD. So, um, I was kind of nervous to do this because... Obviously, I'm not diagnosed. I'm not on the spectrum. Even though I do have family members, my sibling is. She's on the spectrum. Um, okay, I need to think about how I want to word this. Because, like, I'm just getting my thoughts out now. And then we'll do, like, a proper intro in a little bit. But I'm, like, kind of nervous to do this. Because, dude, I... <laughs> I, like... I love and hate the left sometimes because there's there's a fine line between like like the nuances of being an advocate is really or advocate is very difficult because you want to bring awareness and talk about things but then you also don't want to like repress repressed voices more that's why like I think it's really important to like listen to um people who actually have that lived experience, whether it be POC or people who have disabilities or people who live in repressed communities, that they are the ones who speak, right? You listen to their stories 
But I think doing this day on stream is okay. Because it's mainly meant for people who are contemplating getting a proper diagnosis or an evaluation. And I think, because I was skimming through all the resources earlier that we're going to be going over today. Um, they're in the pin chat. I'll go ahead and link it for the VOD watchers. We are going to be looking at information from embraceautism.com. I put it in the chat. Hiding, oh, it's not hiding from the screen. Anyway, so we're going to be looking at resources before that and then taking the test. So there will, this is an educational stream. I don't know why I'm speaking so softly. It's because one of my roommates is home and I know he's like listening. <laughs> but I was indifferent because with the prevalence of the internet, a lot of people are like, exposed to more people who are different from them and also like you are it's so easy to find information on things online where in general i feel like people are more aware of asd people of autism and the like and it's we'll, we'll, we'll do a deep dive later also i need to mention now and i'll mention again later trigger warning there may be mentions of neglect or abuse today it just depends on like how much i want to share and i don't know what will come out you know what i mean so Bod watchers, <laughs> be care, tread lightly. And I'll mention it again later whenever I do a proper intro. But yeah, so that's kind of like, I did roll, I did run a poll on Twitter, like asking about like, is it okay to do this on stream? Because I remember I watched like Ludwig do it on stream a week ago. And like he, he handled it like pretty well. Like he's very mature about it. There wasn't much goofing and gaffing, you know? And... I think it's important to normalize it because I grew up in Washington State. So in a lot of classrooms, they're not like people who there's uh, mm, like the special education classrooms. They are separate from the uh, I don't want to say normal, but from like the general students, right? And then there are some students who are like integrated into the general classrooms. And I know for my district in particular, um, kids who were on the spectrum were in the general classrooms, unless they had um, nonverbal tendencies. And then they, t they typically were put into the special education classrooms. And this is in like, um, this is for like elementary. In, more, in the more middle and high school classes, I know they were more integrated into the general classrooms. And I think it's really interesting to see and learn about how access to education in the sense of like just younger kids being exposed to more disabled children early on when they're younger is a lot more beneficial to like the social growth of disabled children and then also like the general children who like get to see that those kids are still kids. You know what I mean? Because it's very easy to otherize people if you don't know about them or if they seem, um, or like if you don't know about them, I think is the best way to say it. Because it's, it's natural to be scared of the unknown. And I think it's really important to have younger kids and also middle and high school year kids like interact and see other kids who may be different and it's totally okay to be different okay so that's kind of like what i was thinking before going into this i'm still like really nervous i've like done a whole bunch of like internet quizzes like just on stream or on my own but i haven't taken any spectrum quizzes and it's mainly because like i'm scared a little bit not like scared of like potentially being on the spectrum but trigger warning like it, it makes me think about like if i would have gotten a screening or diagnosis sooner like how could my life be different and that's ultimately up to like parents and stuff because it's the parents responsibility when they're younger to like take them to the doctor to do checkups and the like so if, if anybody's watching this and they're older or they're con considering having kids, just make sure to keep this in mind. Like, you need to be 
aware of like general symptoms that way you know the best you know what can be done to best help your child okay now i think i've done enough yapping editor cut to here <laughs> cut to here okay should i hide the sub goal i'm not farming right Nah, I mean, on the other scene, it's not there. I'll keep it on. I'll keep it on. Okay. Dude, I hate doing YouTube intros. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> but it's, it's like, cringe in a funny way, you know what I mean? Dude, my voice is so... It's not it today. It's not it. I barely talked yesterday, too. <laughs> Wait, it's a funny story. I got ice cream with my sister yesterday afternoon and at that point like I didn't talk at all during the day and I remember I was ordering my ice cream and then my voice cranked <laughs> and I was so embarrassed but it's like dude I was wearing this sweater too like I look like a little kid <laughs> okay I'm, I'm ready now <laughs> okay okay April is Autism Awareness Month, so in honor of that, today I'm going to be taking the RR. Fuck. <laughs> Did I can't even get the acronym right? Today, so in honor of that, I'm going to be taking the RAA DSR questionnaire. It's not necessarily a quiz, but it's mainly a pre screening tool to help people who are considering getting, um, it's to help people who are considering getting an autism diagnosis or screening. So, Today is going to be an educational stream. Get your notepads and pencils out. Review Cornell format. You're going to be learning. Go ahead and add educational to the tags as well. The reason why I'm doing this is mainly to, one, talk about my own lived experiences, about what I currently experience, and then also I have a sibling who is on the spectrum. And before I go into today, I want to make clear, anything that I share about myself is totally fine with me. And anything I share about my sister is with her consent as well. She and I talked about this before I streamed this to make sure that she's totally okay with it. With, that way she's totally okay with whatever I talk about. Granted, she's still anonymous, so you guys will like never see her anyway, so it's fine. Okay. <clears throat> and another thing, I will be putting the resources that I'm using on stream today in the description below. And also additional resources, that way if you want to do some more research on your own, feel free to. Last thing, wait, <laughs> I can't, dude, the YouTube intros are so hard to do, okay, I need to get, like, dude, OB, no, obvious, um, Elgato launched, like, a teleprompter, like, attachment to cameras you can get, and it's kind of wild, I considered getting one, but, like, imagine getting a teleprompter for, like, a 30-second YouTube intro, like, why would I drop $400 on that, that's so stupid, and also, like, how, like, weird would it be to, like, stare in the camera the whole time? It's like, I'm not a news reporter. Okay, I need to do the last part. <laughs> okay. Last thing, depending on how much I'm willing to share, just a brief trigger warning. There may be mentions of abuse, neglect, and or mental illness. Because that may or may not be part of my lived experience. So just a little... <laughs> so just a... <laughs> Why am I laughing? So just a brief disclaimer before we jump into it. I also will be linking resources below. <laughs> Wait, I can't. I can't. No, it, I can't link stuff. There's like, it's so dumb. On Twitch, like, you can't add a description to your videos, I don't think. Maybe there is, but like, nobody fucking looks at it. So it's like, I wish they had that. Like, on all my YouTube VODs and in any YouTube video I publish, like, I always put timestamps or so many links I can put, but... On Twitch, nobody looks at the description. Like, nobody looks. Okay. I think I'm ready. I'm scared. Type 1 if you're scared. And we're it. Do not fear. I'm using an incognito tab. Do-do-do. Okay, I gotta rearrange my windows a little bit. 
you know, I'm streaming from my laptop. I now only have one laptop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is what happens when I don't click go live for two days. I'm too giggly. I don't, okay, also, I'd like to clarify, I don't have any jokes today. Like, there's no, like, props today. Serious stream. Okay, so first we're going to be going a little bit into what autism is and can look like, including symptoms. And these are all from EmbraceAutism.com. These are research and articles by Dr. Natalie Engelbrecht and Ava Silvertont. They'll also be linked below in the description. So let's go ahead and do some learning. Okay, so I skimmed this earlier. So the first, this is their homepage. The first has like just links to all these different quizzes that you can use to like pre-screen yourself. And they're varying lengths, but today we're gonna be taking the rads, 80 questions. But watch till the end. Okay, so this section here, strength and kryptonite, these go into more like specific symptoms. So we'll touch those later. Okay, I think I'm just going to read the whole homepage, and then we'll go from there. Hello, we are Dr. Natalie Engelbrich, an autistic rod-to-row-pathic doctor, doctor registered psychotherapist and an autism researcher with a Master's of Science in Applied Psychology, and Ava Silvertot, an autistic ADHD award-winning graphic designer, illustrator, type designer, and autism researcher with a Master's in Psychology. You might call us an autism spectro duo, the dream team. <clears throat> Embrace Autism is, a, is our effort to bring you research and experience-based autism content. Sorry. <laughs> I was, okay. I was going to touch on this jokingly earlier, but I think it's, like, not cool to joke about. I think it's, like, really... Mm, I think it is damaging whenever people self-diagnose or joke about having autism when they don't have it. Because then you're still being ableist. Like... Like, every, like, oh, my TikTok for you page is telling me I'm autistic, but it's like, let's, let's not. Like, that's not chill. Oh, a big thing that I want to say, and I will reiterate later, is I know a lot of people infantilize the symptoms and think it's quirky or kind of trendy to be on the spectrum. And that could be a fallacy in itself. But be careful when you're like exploring this and exploring self-diagnosis always talk to a medical professional um because at its core autism is still a disability it can be really debilitating for some so don't like try to minimize it don't make fun of it because it's still a huge group of people that you're affecting when you conduct yourself in that way okay anyway going back to it embrace also <laughs> dude i can't even say it <laughs> I never used to have a stutter. Okay. Embrace Autism is our effort to bring you research and evidence-based autism content to help you better understand yourself, empower yourself, and embrace your advantages and overcome your challenges. Autism Spectrum Difference. A neurodevelopmental difference characterized by alterations in social functioning, hypersensitivity to stimuli, repetitive behaviors, and deep interests, often combined with advanced cognitive and perceptive abilities. Sorry, abilities make it sound like you're a superhero. <laughs> uh, touching on this, a lot of people will, when they think of autism, they think of the one guy who, like, can easily map up whole cities. Like, that's cool. But not everybody's like that. For a lot, it's really debilitating. Okay, I think that's just a graphic. Okay, q and <clears throat> What is Autistic Savant Syndrome? Savant Syndrome is a condition characterized by mental disabilities combined with exceptional abilities usually related to memory. Although rare or disproportionate, 1 in 10 autistic people are savants. That's cool. Is there a link between autism and giftedness? A link has been found between autism and high intelligence. Estimated rates of intellectual giftedness in autistic children is 0.7 to 2% compared to up to 1% in the general public. Some researchers regard autism as a disorder of high intelligence. Hmm. 
I'm trying to think. When I was younger, obviously my sister was on the spectrum. And I remember there was one other kid, they were our neighbor, who had Asperger's, but is now referred to as ASD. And it's really, like, because, like, I was aware of this when I was younger, but I didn't, like, understand all the nuances until I was an adult. Like, I just wish I would have been, like, nicer. Like, I wasn't mean to the neighbor, but, like, I didn't understand a lot of, like, their troubles, I guess. But that's what it comes down to. Like, once you educate yourself more, you learn how to best accommodate people, how to best interact. <clears throat> are autistic females rare? Autistic females are not actually rare, but since, but since autism presents differently in females, many are misdiagnosed or remain undiagnosed. What was thought to be a 4 to 1 male to female ratio of autism is now predicted to be 2 to 1. Possibly even 1 to 1. Yeah, I, dude, I see so many, like, anecdotal stories, like, on Reddit or TikTok of, like, a lot of women not realizing they're on the spectrum till they're an adult because they're just told that, oh, you're being emotional or it's normal for you to express yourself this way. That's why always, if you are unsure, talk to a medical professional. They will help guide you. Do autistic people lack empathy? It is a damaging myth that autistic people lack empathy. We can be highly empathetic, but may not always sense the socially appropriate way to communicate it. Additionally, displays of empathy may be delayed until the situation is more salient to us. Obviously, every person is different, and it's not appropriate to generalize. That's the main takeaway from this paragraph. Why is routine important to autistic people? Routine provides a framework to make things controlled and manageable. It gives us something we can rely on in a predominantly unpredictable world. An interrupted routine can disrupt our entire schedule as we have to reconsider slash reassess everything. Not gonna lie. I really hate when things change in the schedule. <laughs> we'll, we'll touch on that later. What is an autistic meltdown and shutdown? When we are triggered by social stress, a meltdown can ensue, which can resemble a tantrum. A shutdown is a response to social triggers or sensory overload, after which the person becomes unresponsive and has to rest in order to change. I remember when Sia's movie came out and they got a lot of critique for the portrayal of the main character having meltdowns and shutdowns. And I think that was a prime example of not having enough people who were who are on the spectrum in media and then also, it w I feel like that movie, because I've only seen clips and highlights, I've never sat and watched the whole thing, but from the things that I have seen, it made it seem like they were otherizing and ostracizing that individual more than anything. But we'll touch on that later. And then these are just like affirmations. Really cute. Feel free to screenshot. Really cute. Okay, and then these are just like deep dives into more specific like sections, or not sections, like different um, symptoms and diagnoses that correlate with autism. So first up, Alex Ithmia. Alexithmia, or emotional blindness, is so common among autistics, 40 to 70%, that is commonly mistaken for autism itself. Okay, not gonna lie, my sister has this. <laughs> it, it's so funny. This is a story she said I could share. She doesn't feel the need to express herself, which is totally fine. She usually just has, like, a neutral face. Like, she's not, like, doing YouTube thumbnail pogs, you know? And there's been so many times where I've been with her, or she's told me, where, like, somebody will say a joke and she just, like, won't laugh. And then they'll, like, look at her. And then she'll say, like, oh, I'm autistic. And then the other person is, like, <gasps> they're, like, kind of shocked. <laughs> and, like, because they thought, like, them being mean. Like, they, they thought they were being mean by asking why she didn't laugh. And it's so funny because my sister is a few years younger than me. But I, I tell her, I was, like, you know, if you feel comfortable, like, pull out the A card, you know? Like, make them shake in their boots a little bit. <laughs> okay overwhelm autistic people can get overwhelmed at times here i describe my experience of three types of overwhelm related to autism sensory overload meltdown and shutdown i actually want to like 
read more about that. We'll touch on that later. Because there's still some that I need to learn. Meltdowns. To remain regulated and functioning, we need to be able to dis dissipate stress. When this is not done effectively, it can have an explosive result, leading to a meltdown or a consequent shutdown. PTSD. PTSD is very common in autism as the autistic brain has difficulty bringing information from one hemisphere to the other, which makes it difficult to process trauma. Oof. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, that's for me and my therapy to talk, therapist to talk about. Okay, so that was like general information on the homepage. I kind of want to, like me personally, I want to learn more about overwhelming. Because... Um, personally, my sister, she doesn't have meltdowns, but she will have shutdowns sometimes. So this is something that I need to learn more about to best, you know, support her, you know? Okay. Written by Martin Silvertent. The Autistic Experience of Overwhelm, published 2019, updated 2021. Okay, the sensory overload. I'm skimming. Oh, this, this, wait, wait. Oh, okay. I think this article is just talking about the writer's lived experience. I want to, like, learn more about, like, the actual thing, though. Okay, I don't think this is as helpful for me. I'm going back to the homepage. <laughs> I feel so awkward. Okay. Oh, this is the one I wanted to look at. Autism strengths. So this is going more into, like, potential symptoms. Okay. Autism strengths. Did you know that autistic people have abilities beyond the range experienced by neurotypicals? Okay, it's... Sorry. Why is it essay? Like, <laughs> why do they choose that acronym? Okay. Are autism strengths, by which we mean unusual talents, skills, qualities, and advantages, often beyond the normal range of human experience, can set autistic people apart in positive ways that allow us to make unique contributions to society. While not every autistic person will have all the strengths listed below, scientific research has found these traits to be common. The reason we find it useful to keep a list like this is that, like us, you may very well discover some strengths you didn't even know you had, and getting to know our strengths can be both validating and empowering. Okay, sensory strengths. Visual hypersensitivity. Autistic people can have extraordinary vision with, with better visual hypersensitivity, pattern recognition, and attention to details. Autistic people can see visual details that non-autistics don't tend to register. I've always wondered why this happens. Because a lot of the early signs in like toddlers and very young children is watching how they play with their toys. Like... They will either like categorize or sort their toys, like their blocks, instead of like building like a tower. It's really interesting to see how it's like innate. Okay, tunnel vision. The focus of attention in autistics was found to be sharper and a sharper spatial gradient of attention was observed. Essentially, they experienced tunnel vision with great clarity of detail at the end of the tunnel. Color intensity. Researchers have found changes in the rods and cones in autistic children's eyes. 85% saw colors with greater intensity than neurotypical children. For these children, red appears nearly fluorescent. Whoa. That's like... Okay, I never knew this. That's kind of cool. Man, they see colors different? That's wild. Rhythm with the tism? Imagine. Hi, Vic. Can we get some yo's? Hello. I, okay, I want to learn more about this. The color intensity. 
Okay, so this is Heightened Sensory Perceptions by Dr. Natalie Engelbrecht. Many autistic people report heightened sensory perceptions, and research confirms this. First, extraordinary vision. One example of heightened sensory perceptions is being able to read tiny text, like the small print on the back of products from across a room. Wait, that's wild! Okay, I think I'm just blind. <laughs> Wait, that's crazy! Below is the world's smallest book, entitled Teeny Ted from Turn Up Town, next to a minute scratch. You need an election microscope to read it, or maybe just an autistic with extraordinary vision. Wait, okay, actually? That's like superhero shit, like not even joking. Being able to see that far? And that clearly? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Why can't I have that? Visual hypersensitivity. Our brains have allocated more brain resources our brains have allocated more brain resources in the area associated with visual perception or our brains have allocated more brain resources in the areas associated with visual detection resulting in visual hypersensitivity. Specifically, autistics have more brain re This is a lot of talking. Specifically, autistics have more brain resources associated with visual detention and identification, but less activity in the areas used to plan and control thoughts and actions. This results in outstanding capacities in visual tasks. Huh. You know, now that I think about it, my favorite books when I was younger was, like, the Where's Waldo ones. <laughs> Many autistic people are able to see changes in the gap size on a screen filled with the letter C, much better than neurotypicals. We grow up not knowing that others do not see the world the same as us. They don't need to see air particles, some of us do. This is a quote. My bed was surrounded and totally encased by tiny spots, which I called stars, like some kind of mystical glass coffin. I've since learned that they are actually airborne particles, yet my vision was so hypersensitive that they often became a hypnotic foreground with the rest of the world fading away. Interesting. Pattern recognition. Autistic people show increased pattern recognition. Quote, Autistics exhibit more activity in the temporal and obsec occipital regions and less activity in frontal cortex than non-autistics. The identified temporal and occipital regions are typically involved in perceiving and recognizing patterns and objects. Detail-oriented. Autistic people tend to see more details than neurotypicals because we process a greater amount of sensory information. When neurotypicals focus on faces, autistic people tend to look around and see the details. Um, common trend of face blindness. This is what my sister has. She will very much recognize somebody off of, like, the clothes they wear. Oh, yeah. She'll very much recognize someone more so off the clothes they wear than their actual face. Which can be kind of troubling. <laughs> so, like, I know whenever I go out, I make sure I wear the same coat when I'm with her. <laughs> okay. When you show a neurotypical in an autistic person a forest, they do see the trees. But autistics also see the insects, the flowers, the moss, etc., as well as their constituents and intricacies. Optical illusions. In addition, autistic people are less susceptible on average to optical illusions. This is because we tend to focus on the details as opposed to the gas stained. Hmm. Color perception. Our rods and cones are different. 85% of us see colors with greater intensity than neurotypicals, with red appearing nearly fluorescent. 10% saw red as neurotypical children do, and 5% saw muted colors. Okay, so this graph, like, demonstrates what the red would look like, the fluorescent red. I never knew about this color perception thing. I'll have to ask my sister later. I did have my sister take the quiz. I'll go into her score later. <laughs> Ooh, I learned a little bit there. I gotta get my notepad out. <clears throat> okay. Synesthesia. Synesthesia. Synesthesia is a condition in which multiple senses are perceived simultaneously. 
A study from the 2013 indicated that synesthesia occurs in 18.9% of autistic people compared to 7.2 in the control group. Okay, what is, I want to learn more about this. Synes Written by Dr. Ango Brech and Ava Silvertont. Autism and synesthesia. Quote, it's not only numbers that I can see in colors. Words, too, for me, have colors and emotions and textures. Oh, okay, I think I've seen a little bit about this before. Synesthesia. Synesthesia occurs when the stimulation of one sensory modular modality automatically evokes a perception in another unstimulated mode. mode. Dude, there's so many hard words. I took AP Lit in high school. Okay. Evokes a perception in another unstimulated modality. In other words, one sensory experience activates another sensory experience. So synesthesia is, de is defined as a joining of senses, where, for instance, music may trigger colors and words may trigger tastes. Okay, I've never experienced this. At first glance, synesthesia and autism may appear to have nothing to do with each other. In this post, I'll explain why the two actually have a significant connection. Prevalence of synesthesia. Research has indicated that autistic people have greater than average chance of having synesthesia. While autism occurs in approximately 1% to 2.5% of the population, and synesthesia occurs in 4% of the population, the co-occurrence in conditions would statistically be 0.04 or 4 in every 10,000 people. However, synesthesia However, synesthesia was diagnosed in an impressive 19% of autistic people, compared to the 4% in the general population. Sensory sensitivity. Research has found significant pheno phenotypic and genetic overlap between synesthesia and absolute pitch, a trait that has been reported to occur at increased frequency in autistic people. Furthermore, experts in both conditions published in the journal Scientific Reports found that both synesthetes and autistics experience heightened sensory sensitivity the most common types research has found that in people who are both autistic and synesthetes the, the most common types were known as chromesthesia or color sound synthesia when a sound triggers a visual experience or color and grapheme color synthesia seeing black letters as colored other types of synesthesia were seeing color when exposed to taste or smells. Hyperconnectivity. Researchers have sought the reason behind the significant increase in synesthesia in autistic people and found an approximate answer. Both conditions involve atypical neural connectivity and indeed neuroimaging studies confirm that synesthesia is associated with differences in brain structure and or function. The hyperconnectivity hypothesis provides proposes that people with synesthesia have excessive neutral connections or have excessive neural connections between different regions. These connections are either diminished or absent in neurotypical individuals. Four mechanisms have been proposed to account for neural hyperconnectivity. Faulty axonal pruning, differences in axon guidance, dis disinhibition, and atypical border formation. Okay, this is a lot. Oh, it's almost over. Okay, I'll read the rest. I'll read the rest. Okay, white matter connections. Both autism and synesthesia are characterized by increased white matter tracts connecting different parts of the brain. Some of these connections traverse the entire brain from the frontal cortex back to the occipital lobe while other white matter tracts connect adjacent regions. The autistic brain also shows increased volume of short-distance white matter connections due to the proliferations of synaptogenesis, the creation of new connections, or a failure in the pruning out of these synaptic connections during childhood. Synesthetes also show an increased density of white matter, especially in the sensory regions of the condition. For example, graph me color synesthesia, has increased connections between the region responsible for color perception and the visual word form area. Synaptic pruning. Synesthesia is quite common in brains that show a lack of synaptic pruning. 
causing anomalous patterns of connectivity. Some forms of synesthesia, such as graph me color synesthesia, emerge due to cross activity, where clusters of neurons are activated at once. Effectively, more neurons than necessary are being activated, which can give rise to combining of senses that a brain with fewer neural connections with fewer neuronal collections would likely not experience. Other forms of synesthesia, such as lexical gustatory synesthesia, emerge from increased connectivity between adjacent regions in the brain, thus connecting senses as well. Note that although synesthesia may seem extraordinary, it's not necessarily a beneficial or wanted experience. It can be a distraction. It can drastically undermine someone's life and can even be painful, as is often the case in mirror touch synesthesia. Yeah, I've seen some like YouTube videos of people explaining and then the editor is trying to like trampos imagery to on the film to make it look like you're experiencing it. It doesn't look fun. Like when they were saying it it is very debilitating. Okay, so that was synesthesia. Acute hearing. Autistic people were found to have an increased auditory perceptual cavity relative to neurotypicals. This increased capacity may offer an explanation to the auditory superiority, superiorities such as heightened pitch detection. Superior auditory discrimination. Autistic people tend to be better at detecting a target sound within a group of sounds and notice irrelevant background information more readily. About one in five autistic individuals show exceptional frequency discrimination skills. Heightened pitch detection. Some autistic people show superiority in memorizing picture pitch, picture pitch associations and in detecting pitch changes in melodies. A subset of autistic a subset of autistic individuals known as musical savants is also known to possess absolute pitch. Lastly, enhanced olfactory detection. Autistic people show enhanced connectivity between the the lamus, a brain area responsible for laying sensory information and insula, which is thought to be the cause of heightened sensitivity to smell, sound, and taste. Cognitive strengths. Correlation with giftedness. Some researchers regard autism as a disorder of high intelligence, as estimated rates, as estimated rates of intellectual giftedness in autistic children is 0.72%, compared to up to 1% in the general population. Savant syndrome. Savant syndrome is characterized by a stark contrast between disability and profound ability in music, art, mathematics, or medical or mechanical domains, and occurs in 10 to 28.5% of autistic people, compared to 1% in the general population. Powerful memory system. Autistic people can have enhanced or even savant-like memory. This is due to our greater declarative memory. It is this memory that allows us to memorize many things, including thousands of social scripts. Encyclopedic knowledge. Due to their special interests and fixations, people with high-functioning autism tend to be autodidacts and can have encyclopedic knowledge in a particular area and are often considered experts in particular subjects. You know what's crazy? My dad had a photographic memory. Kind of wild. He, he, <laughs> it was also really bad because he would like just say people's license places out loud. Like if somebody cut him off, he would like yell out the window the guy's license plate number. Thankfully, nobody shot us in road rage, but <laughs> he loved flexing his his memory. <clears throat> Superior problem solving. Autistic people are up to 40% faster at problem solving and appear to use perceptual regions of the brain to accelerate problem solving. Autistics have been found to be superior in processing complex patterns. Okay, I don't- that's not me. <laughs> Y'all know I hate puzzle games. Rational decision making. Research indicates autistic people are less likely to make irrational decisions and are less influenced- are, and are less influenced by gut instincts. Consistently in pattern of choice and attention to detail helps them avoid being swayed by their emotions. Hyperfocus. Autistic people are able to exert an intense form of mental concentration or visualization called hyperfocus that focuses consciousness on a subject, topic, or task and are significantly more able to focus for extended periods of time.
hypersystemizing. Autistic people tend to have a high drive to analyze or construct systems called systemization. As such, they tend to be great at pattern recognition of systems and often show talent in systemizable domains. You know what's funny? So my sister lost her job last year and she worked with a job coach who had worked with people who are on the spectrum. And it was really cute because <laughs> my sister was talking about like how she likes making Google Docs to like plan vacations. Dude, my sister is planning another trip for next year and she has like a five page doc hour by hour of her next Japan trip. And she was showing that to like her job coach and the coach was like, Oh, you definitely need to put organized in your skills. <laughs> I really like how they're like angling this like superpowers. It's really cute. Pattern recognition. The autistic brain excels at recognizing pattern. The autistic brain excels at recognizing patterns. In fact, brain regions associated with recognizing patterns, temporal and occipital, occipital temporal and occipital areas light up more in autistic peoples than in general populations. Increased adaptive coding. Research found that women in contrast with men should increase adaptive coding of face identity in correlation with the levels of autistic traits related to social interactions, making them better at discriminating between many faces. Oh, okay. <laughs> Lateral thinking. Research shows a link between autistic traits and unusual and novel ideas, which occurs due to their strong ability to think outside the box. In studies, autistic people were far more likely to generate creative ideas than non-autistics. Behavioral strengths, strong worth, strong work ethic. Autistic people make a lot of hard task choices despite small rewards, and the brain continues to reward intrinsically for doing hard work, regardless of repetition. The lack of need for novelty can sustain our joy in both work and relationships. Okay, I want to learn more about this. Written by Martin Silvertent. Article Autistics Work Hard, published 2018, updated 2023. Clinical observations indicate that autistics may have reduced motivation to seek social interaction, yet a heightened motivation to expend effort in the pursuit of certain non-social stimuli. In other words, we tend to prefer doing work or pursuing interests over socializing, but also we expand effort on our pursuits for lesser rewards, which is double-edged sword we are more likely to pursue interests despite fewer rewards, but because of this we make ourselves vulnerable to being taken advantage of, like researchers from a 2012 study state. Quote, Clinical observations suggest that individuals with ASD may show dysregulated reward-based effort. Um, I feel really bad. Because... Um, I'm talking about my sister now. Like, I've talked about her, about, like, her dreams and aspirations. And she's very much, like, happy with doing what she's doing. Like, no matter if she makes shit money, if she makes good money, she will do a good job no matter what she does. This is why I wanted to read more about this article. Okay. Repetitive behaviors. In, a, in the table below from a study from 2012, you can see how autistics, 20 compared to non-autistics, 38, on a myriad of factors including insistence on sameness, circumscribed interests and in motor stereotypies on the interview of repetitive behaviors a diagnostic instrument used to assess autism on the basis of willingness and desire to do repetitive tasks I have an art degree, not a science degree. <laughs> okay, let me explain what the three highlighted factors mean. Okay. So, IRB, insistence on sameness, circumscribed interests, and motor stereotypies. Insistence on sameness, the desire for sameness, and a tendency to do or think about the same thing repeatedly, as if doing so were a comfort or a compulsion. The insistence on sameness also comes with resistance to change or a proneness to dysregulate when a routine is interrupted. 
circumscribed interests. An intense focus on and or interest in certain objects or topics. Watching the circular movements of a washing machine or memorizing numbers. Motor stereotypies. Common repetitive rhythmic movements. Example, stimming with typical onset in early childhood. Pursuing interests. In the table above, that autistics score significantly higher on these three factors than neurotypicals. Motor stereotypies emerged as a way of stress relief or enhancement of certain sensory experiences. While this often presents as stimming, it can also be used in pursuit of interests or indeed shape those very interests in the first place. For example, the need for repetitive rhythmic movements may influence one to get into music and perhaps in particular drumming. Circumscribed interests refer to our, our intense focus on the things that interest us. As a result, a lot of us are autodicts. Autodidact. Autodidacts. Autodidacts. And tend to be experts of sorts in particular fields or topics, since we tend to dig deep into the subjects we love and try to know everything there is to know about the topic. Insistence on sameness is a relevant factor because in combination with decreased social, motiva with decreased social motivation, autistics are prone to self-study or practice as they emerge themselves in topics of interest. The insistence on sameness can thus be highly conductive to one's pursuit of interest as well as adhering to a routine regarding work. Also, you know what else is hard work? Subscribing, because guys, we are an hour to stream. I have to run an ad. I gotta do it. Sub with Prime, easy clap. Get back to it. <clears throat> Hard task choices and reward probability. Not only do we tend to be driven by the things we love at expense of social motivation, but we are also more willing to perform certain tasks for lesser rewards. In the graph below, you can see the probability of acquiring a reward relates to the number of hard task choices being made, where you can see that autistic people choose to do more hard task choices, but also choose to do more despite a much lower reward probability compared to controls. From a 2012 study. Okay, conclusion. Then the graphs are just going into more detail. Conclusion. While neurotypicals acquire dopamine for social situations, and mouse models even show that social isolation increases the drive to seek out social behavior, they experience diminished pleasure from repeated exposure to food, things, and tasks. Autistics, on the other hand, are largely denied dopamine in social situations. Instead, our brains continue to reward us intrinsically for doing work and are pursuing our interests, regardless of repetition. So it's not that we don't get bored by repetition necessarily, we tend to pursue these activities over socializing. We derive more pleasure from them, and we are more prone to expand effort despite lower rewards. The autism slogan for work ethic might be something along the lines of, quote, Works hard for little, requires no time off, if given time off, we'll work some more. End quote. Such has been our experience, in any case, provided we love the work we do. Note. This is no excuse for employers to overwork autistic employees at the minimum salary. Rather, it is a testament to our, worth, to our work ethic. Treat us and pay us well. We can do wondrous things. Fair warning to autistics. Don't undersell yourself or do a lot of work slash favors without ever getting anything back for it. I've done it many times myself, where I invest time in helping others, but don't ever get the same time investment in return. It's not like I always expect something in return, but when you give a lot and never get anything back, you should ask yourself if your time isn't better spent on personal pursuits than so many favors for others. Hmm. They're hard workers. Challenges. Every superhero has their kryptonite, and some of our abilities have drawbacks too. Just as every superhero has unique weaknesses or kryptonites, which they tend to face head-on to reach their full potential, autistic people also face certain unique challenges. Some of these challenges are inherent to autism, while other challenges emerge out of social issues such as interpersonal mismatches. See the dialectical misattunement hypothesis. 
and the double empathy problem, or societal issues such as lack of accommodations. Once again, not every autistic person may encounter all of these struggles, but this list may help you recognize yours and learn to improve and better manage your challenges. <clears throat> Reduced effect display. Autistic people often show flat effect, which is a reduction in emotional effect expressiveness due to an apparent lack of facial expressions or vocal inflection. As such, autistic individuals can be hard to read, which can make some people uncomfortable. Yeah, like I told earlier, my sister rarely expresses herself. She has been like, it's really cute. We've been moved out of our parents' house for about a year and a half now, and she has become a lot more expressive with me and friends, and it's really cute to see. But it's, it's important to acknowledge that not every you should never force somebody to mask, never force somebody to engage. Always make sure that, like, you have clear boundaries with your friends and families. Did I already take the quiz? No! We have to educate ourselves, and then we'll take the quiz. But hi, Kobobo. Can we get some yo's? Hello. And I feel like it's better to, like, learn more about it before. That way I have a better understanding of the questions. Wait, what's the Ludwig ass song? <coughs> do do do. Do do do. Do do do. Okay. Fear response to calm chemicals. When afraid, people can release chemicals that act as con. ton. contagion? Contagion? I'm gonna start over. Fear responds to calm chemicals. When afraid, people release chemicals that act as contagion to fear. Autistic people, however, relax from smelling fear sweat and become anxious from smelling calm chemicals. No wonder social gatherings cause anxiety. I know I hate sweat, like genuinely. Like if I exercise or if I get sweaty, I have to wash up. Cognitive challenges. Low theory of mind. Theory of mind is undermined in autistic people, leading to difficulties with attributing mental states. This may cause one to make wrong assumptions in social situations or misread or fail to read emotions, intentions, or cues from others. So, clueless. I've, I've thought about this a lot in particular, because there's been a few times where my sister will come to me and be like, hey, this happened, like, what should I do? Or like, how should I interpret this? And I feel like a lot of my answers are just what I've learned to do. So a, a huge reason why I'm like reading all this before is I know I demonstrate signs and I'm not sure like, cause I never got like an evaluation when I was younger or as an adult. So I'm not sure like if I've just spent my whole life like masking or if I'm like genuinely like this. Anyway. Rigid or inflexible thinking. As a result of high systemizing mechanism in autistic people, they do not tend to cope very well with symptoms of high variance or change, including the social world of other minds, and tend to be change resistant. Going back to the scheduling, they like when there's a set schedule. High prevalence of PTSD. Autism may serve as vulner as autism may serve as a vulnerable Autism may serve as a vulnerability marker for post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, by increasing the risk for exposure to traumatic events and may exuberate autism, autism, autism symptoms through maladaptive coping strategies and reduced help-seeking. Alexithmia co-occurrence. 40 to 65% of autistic people have alexithmia. And an inability to identify or describe emotions. Several cognitive issues usually described or usually ascribed to autism, example face perception deficits and fluctuating empathy, actually stem from alexithmia. When we were younger, like I said, my sister gave me permission to share. My sister was nonverbal until she was four years old. So she was in like a specialized preschool and like specialized daycare when she was very young. And I remember my mom had little charts and like because obviously my sister didn't talk so my sister would have to point to the chart on like different emotions like are you happy are you sad and like different items throughout the house that she'd want and i think she stopped using that when she was like five or six 
it's really interesting to learn more like the more specific nuances of autism. <clears throat> identifying facial expressions. On account of alexithmia, autistic people often have challenges identifying emotional, emotional facial expressions due to difficulties interpreting intact sensory descriptions. This can lead to social friction. Forgetting faces. Research indicates autistic children seem to have a remarkably smooth fusiform gyrus, the part of the brain that helps us recognize faces. Additionally, autistic adults often report not being able to recognize or memorize faces. Diminished adaptive coding. Research found that men, but not women, showed, redu showed reduced adaptive coding of face identity in correlation with the levels of autistic traits related to social interactions, making it harder to dis discriminate between many faces. Reduced face after effects. Part of this adaptive coding relates to a face identity after effects, which is an opposite after image of what is being perceived, which aids in differentiating faces. Autistic children were found to experience half of the amount of after effects as controls. Wait, what? Oh, so I think this is implying that they have difficulty, like, recalling what they've seen concerning faces. I think. Excessive daydreaming. Autistic people are sensitive, making them prone to trauma, which can result in maladaptive daydreaming in order to escape from reality as a way of alleviating stress and emotional pain, or to seek an internal companionship to alleviate loneliness. Active resting network. The resting network of autistic people does not fire up or switch off like it does for non-autistics. A clear correlation was found between the low level of, of activity in the resting network during rest and difficulties in social behaviors. Sensory differences. Sensory overload. Autistic people filter out less sensory information, meaning more information has to be processed. This makes us prone to sensory overload, which may result in a shutdown unless one can withdraw to a secluded place to wind down. Meltdowns. When an autistic person is triggered by social stress and or sensory overload, a meltdown can ensue, which resembles a tantrum. It may involve yelling, aggression, self-harm, and repetition, and can result in a shutdown. Shutdowns. A shutdown is a response to social stress or sensory overload, after which the person becomes unresponsive or even immobile. A shutdown can result in extreme exhaustion and may be followed up by a nap in order to recharge. Hyper Hyperacusis. Some autistic people have hyperacusis, which is a debilitating hearing disorder characterized by an increased sensitivity to certain frequencies and volume ranges of sound, resulting in an inability to tolerate usual environmental sound. Habitual behaviors. Prone to addiction. The majority of autistic people who have intellectual disability do not use substances. However, Autistic people without intellectual disability have a much higher rate of substance abuse, almost twice as high. Deficient of prediction. Autistic people show a def deficit of prediction, which is thought to be due to altered processing of social signaling errors, and the degree of which these signals were altered correlated with the extent of social deficits. Okay, I want to learn more about this. By Natalie Engel Brech. Autism, a Deficit of Prediction, published 2018, updated 2021. A hallmark feature of autism is difficulty understanding the thoughts and intentions of others. What is behind that? In simple language, neurotypicals have a crystal ball that makes awesomely accurate predictions of what other people are thinking and how they will behave. When the crystal ball does make an error, it automatically upgrades itself to an even more accurate crystal ball. This is why it looks as if neurotypicals have an innate knowledge of social interactions. Autistic people, however, have a crystal ball that looks at the world and makes very bad predictions, and has no self-correcting mechanism. The worse our crystal ball works, the worse our social challenges. It is why so many of us get taken advantage of and abused. Think of it like this. When I was a kid, I had a can that stated peanut butter brittle on it, and when you opened it, out sprang two little spring worms that surprised whoever opened it expecting peanut butter brittle. So a neurotypical gets surprised for the first time, and then after that, never again. A person with autism can fall for the same joke over and over. The worse your crystal ball is, the more likely and more frequently you will fall for the same joke. 
In my own life, this has proven to be problematic, and I often get really mad at myself. When someone is hurtful, I think I will never trust them again. But they are nice, and it happens again, and again, and again. In more scientific language, a hallmark feature in autism is difficulty understanding the thoughts and intentions of others, also known as low theory of mind, which causes social problems. One theory on the social deficits in autism is a coding dis discrepancy between what is the expected and the actual outcome of another's behavior is, resulting in a difference in processing social information. The brain, specifically the gyral surface of the anterior cingulate cortex, signals social prediction errors to neurotypicals, which is altered in autistic people. The degree to which the social signaling error was altered, the <laughs> The degree to which the social signaling error was altered correlated with the extent of social challenges. In addition, in neurotypicals, but not autistics, the degree of the social prediction error is due to the information of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. This is interesting. I know a lot of it has to do with, like, how um, their brain functions. And, like, I, I understood that baseline. But I didn't realize, like, it was that to that level. Like these aren't necessarily learned behaviors. Like a lot of people think they are. Um, yeah, so that was all of the strengths and weaknesses, or rather symptoms, that people on the spectrum may face. That's why it's important to know what the general symptoms are. That way you know like the best way to support your friends or family who may be on the spectrum. And I'll obviously always talk directly with those individuals. That way you know the best way to support them on an individual level, of course. Okay, let's see what else there is. Let's see if there's anything on the blog. 30! I thought it said 30. 300 articles! Oh, this one's important. This one's important. I was going to touch on this. The accommodations. Please make sure to send any accommodation letters to your HR department. Never give it directly to your manager. You should ideally avoid having any of your direct coworkers or management, non-HR figures, know your disability in any capacity. Because you truly never know who will discriminate against you. So always make sure when asking for accommodations, you send a letter to your HR department. And if you need help with it, you can reach out to local your local DSHS, to your local... Um, I know there's like um, local establishments and resource buildings. No. <laughs> um, WorkSource is a really good like national government funded work agency they will help you do all this don't ever feel like you're alone when asking for accommodations in the workplace written by ava silverton workplace accommodations for autism and audhd so autistic adhd published 2024 updated 2024 this is something that's very important um because legally any employer has to make a reasonable accommodation. And obviously there are things that are like very baseline things that you can ask for. And you should have no shame in asking for accommodations, okay? That can simply be like wearing headphones at work or asking for dimmer lights in your office space or even like having a chair to sit in. Like don't ever be afraid to go the more formal route when asking for accommodations. The need for workplace accommodations. Workplace accommodations can be crucial for artistic people. I keep on saying artistic people. <laughs> workplace accommodations can be crucial for artistic people and those with ADHD because they can help to enhance quality of life and work productivity. As such, when you request an accommodation, I think it could be helpful not only to emphasize your needs, but the fact they will, that they will not only make you happier in your job, but, but can also avoid both classical burnout and autistic burnout. And it can improve your productivity in the workplace. So where workplaces might see accommodations as extra privileges or cop-outs, granting certain accommodations could actually be a win-win situation for all parties involved. <clears throat> Should you request work accommodations? 
While I can't offer a conclusive answer to this question, as you will have to outweigh the benefits and potential consequences based on what your workplace is like, I can offer some information about the benefits and consequences other autistic people have experienced. Note also that requesting work accommodations for autism and ADHD is almost inextricably linked to diagnosis disclosure. Disclosing is essential for requesting and receiving workplace accommodations. That is why always go to the HR department. Don't tell your coworkers, don't tell your manager. Always go straight to HR. And another thing that we need to make clear is do not ask for accommodations in a work interview. Do not mention any of your diagnoses or any potential accommodations during a work interview. The only time where it's le- where you're legally protected to disclose it and a company cannot discriminate is when you're filling out an application or once they give you a job offer. If you are in an interview process, do not tell them you have a disability because they're legally able to discriminate at that point. I mean, some workplaces with a more casual approach may offer accommodations simply based on needs you present. But in most cases, there will be a higher consideration of your needs if your employer understands why you have those needs, often corroborated by a formal diagnosis and hence why it's reasonable to accommodate you based on at least a rudimentary understanding of autism or ADHD or on the basis of suggested accommodations as outlined in your, by your diagnosed decision. So let's look at the benefits and consequences. The potential benefits of disclosing may include receiving accommodations, huge dub, greater acceptance in the workplace, increasing awareness, advocacy about autism, increasing overall company morale, and increasing retention of employees. Different studies on both autism and other disabilities indicate that disclosing can create an atmosphere of acceptance by enhancing the employer's understanding of their employees' needs for accommodations and enhanced social integration. Let me reiterate, do not be yapping and spilling the tea to everybody in the workplace. Tell HR first, get accommodations, and then you can chirp, okay? <laughs> like, don't don't be dropping, like, your A card all the time. Unless you feel fully comfortable and can understand that discrimination might happen. Because no matter how woke we are, everybody will always be subconsciously prejudiced to whatever. Everybody has their own, like, underlying... Um, prejudice and you don't know so best bet don't share unless you feel co- fully fully comfortable <clears throat> potential consequences of disclosing some potential consequences may include stigma disability related discrimination social exclusion like feeling excluded in the workplace or discomfort research shows that fear of experiencing negative attitudes is a common reason for non-disclosure a lack of knowledge and experience with people who have a disability may cause discomfort, distancing, and exclusionary behaviors and discriminatory attitudes towards them. I think it's very important to point out that people don't like the unknown. So it's very important that disabilities are talked about and that disabled people are in the workplace. But since a lot of disabilities are either physically or mentally debilitating, like it's not often that disabled people can work. I think it's about 15% of autistic adults are able to keep a job. So because of that, um, that is why discrimination is so prevalent because um, a, a really good example is, I recall one time in junior high, one of the speakers, they were asked, they asked all the kids in the school, we had like a thousand kids at my junior high. They asked everybody in the auditorium, they're like, hey, stand up if you know somebody who like had cancer. And like basically every kid stood up, like, cause it's so common, right? And then they asked, um, stand up if you know of this specific rare disease that one student had. And like only two kids stood up. And obviously like after that assembly we learned more about that rare disease but if you aren't exposed to it you don't know about it and it's like this endless cycle of if people aren't invited to the space they're not going to get into the space so just just be careful whenever you're sharing with coworkers or management about your disability Like, just be mindful that some people will see you and treat you differently. And if somebody is, like, being really fucking mean, report them. 
snitch him. Snitch on him. It doesn't fucking matter, okay? <clears throat> discrimination. A study from 2017 explored potential workplace discrimination against people with disabilities, including autism, by sending job applications to positions when having a disability was unlikely to affect productivity, and found that applicants disclosing a disability, such as autism, received 26% fewer expressions of employer interest. That's why, like, if you are disabled in any form, don't mention it until you have a job offer. Stigma. A study from 2016 explored stigmas associated with autism in the workplace and found that the age of diagnosis, social demands, and organizational support policies affected workplace responses. And they found that autistics who were diagnosed at an earlier age had greater self-esteem and lower perceived discrimination when they disclosed their autism compared to those diagnosed at a later age. I mean, that makes sense because when you're diagnosed when you're younger, you're more likely to get medical care and like get a psychiatrist very early on. So you have like a greater understanding of yourself for like five to ten years more than like an adult would if they got diagnosed as an adult. So this makes sense. <clears throat> okay, types of workplace accommodations. Job application accommodations. In the job application phase, consider asking for adjustments in the job interview. For instance, ask for an online or written format as your alternative, so employers can focus on your skills rather than on performance in an interview. That, that's still kind of hard to do. Still kind of hard to do. Like... The only time you should ask for an accommodation is the section of the application where it says, legally, we are not allowed to discriminate. Please put any accommodations here. Like that form is usually like a separate page. If you're filling out a paper application or it's like usually the last page of an application, like that's the only time when you should disclose it. Like don't, I, I would say, because th this quote is saying like, you can ask for a written application or like a virtual interview. Like I would avoid doing that because if you're going to make any type of extra step for an employer, they're not going to want to deal with that. I'll be honest. Especially for someone they're not going to hire, they're not going to want to do that. So I would say don't, don't do that unless you genuinely feel like you need that to make the experience better for you. Basic accommodations. Common accommodation strategies in various entry-level positions may include maintaining a, maintaining a consistent schedule and responsibilities, using organizers to structure the job, reducing unstructured time, using direct communication, providing reminders and assurances, opportunities to take breaks to manage stress, enable coping tactics, including stimming or soothing by rocking or hand flapping. Communicational accommodations. For artistic people, some communication-based accommodations could be helpful, including avoiding subtext and figurative speech, saying exactly what you mean, Offer exact and comprehensive explanations so the task is clear and nothing is left to interpretation. Use written communication either instead of or, and in addition to verbal communication of tasks and responsibilities. Note that I didn't find the accommodations above in the papers I looked at, but based on personal experience and reports from autistic people, I know these accommodations can help a lot. Out of all of these, asking for written direction is probably the easiest that they will do for you. Like they, they will usually gladly accommodate that. So don't be afraid to ask for that. Organizational accommodations. Structure and consistency can be very important both for autistics and those with ADHD. Autistic people do best when they know what to expect, while people with ADHD do better when they don't have a plan and can rely on consistency. As such, the following accommodations can help. Maintaining a consistent schedule and responsibilities, using organizers to structure the job, reduce unstructured time, giving plenty of notice for upcoming work tasks and consistent meetings and our moments that allow for extra feedback or clarification. When I was doing an MA in psychology online, I was given an accommodation for my ADHD, which entailed weekly scheduled meetings with my student advisor at the same time each week, rather than having to manually schedule an appointment each week, potentially at different times. An accommodation like this could be helpful in the workplace as well, as it provides structure and consistency and avoids having to plan things into a dynamic and ever-changing schedule. See, I never realized you could request accommodations for things as specific as this. You know what I mean? Now I know. 
environmental accommodations. A study from 2018 on work within a tech company highlighted the importance of providing environmental modifications, and a study from 2010 made various suggestions to combat sensory sensitivities, including Avoid the use of fluorescent lights, perhaps in an office or workspace. Provide the option of using dimmer lighting. Permit the use of noise-canceling headphones or earbuds to manage auditory stimulation. Provide a work environment without obtrusive sounds or allow for the use of noise-canceling headphones or earbuds. Allow for temperature adjustments. When a work uniform is required, allow for an alternative with softer fabrics to avoid sensory overwhelm by touch. Provide a workspace without an obtrusive smells such as perfumes. Allow for redesigning or reorganizing with shared sensory furniture. This could be as simple as offering a space without any posters on the wall or other decor that adds visual stimuli. Bodily accommodations. This may sound like a strange category, but I think it's worth emphasizing some on the accommodations that simply allow for bodily autonomy and deviating responses, including allowing for the use of sunglasses or blue light absorbing glasses, permit the use of noise canceling headphones or earbuds to manage auditory stimulation, also permit to wear headphones on both ears as the, asymmetrical, as the asymmetrical sensory input and sensation of an earphone with a single ear can be very obtrusive. Enable coping tactics including stimming or soothing by rocking or hand flapping. Tolerate and allow for more clumsy or slow body movements and responses, quote unquote, unusual body movements or unexpected sensory cues. Acknowledging, tolerating, and maybe even cautiously celebrating the varied ways in which things can be done rather than insisting on a particular way. Allow for extra bathroom breaks, irrespective of whether it's to empty the bladder or relieve some stress through a few minutes of alone time in an isolated environment. Other work conditions related accommodations. One study from 2015 found that among older age groups, some autistics mean age 41.9, and a software engineering company desired accommodations for the following. Business travel, recording meetings to help them reminder, to help them remember work assignments, flexibility to work from home, or to have a quiet office space rather than working in an open plan. Greater disability awareness and sensitivity from colleagues regarding the needs for diverse coworkers. Supportive coworkers, which they felt was an accommodation desired for peer building relationships. Mutual learning and a social skill development, flexible hours, a flexible schedule, and exemption from customer facing situations. Educational accommodations. Some autistics may have a need for extra training to enhance social and communication skills. On-the-job training and learning that addresses core employment skills such as social communication. Involving coworkers in the training helped to build peer relationships and social skill development. Such training also helped employers and coworkers to dispel some of the myths and stereotypes about autistic people, thus combating discrimination and improving work relations. Video modeling through iPods could aid in your work tasks for young autistic adults. They found this form of workplace accommodation was associated with intermediate and substantial gains in the percentage of work steps completed correctly. Enhancing job site training for autistic workers through the use of si simulation. This resulted in a higher level of skill acquisition than job site only training. Okay, whenever I see the word simulation, I think of like the simulator games. And legit, they should have, like, high schoolers play, like, the job sim games. I think that'd be so chill. You know what I mean? Negotiating coworker interactions. Handling customer intercommunication and communication-oriented coping strategies. One study evaluated the impact of communication stories using their personal eye device on participants. They found that after viewing other stories... Autistic people were able to share their personal stories and had strengthened self-esteem in their relationships with their supervisors. In addition, the communication behaviors of workplace supervisors were improved. Now for some actual stats. The rates of requesting and receiving accommodation. Requesting accommodations. The rates of requesting accommodations ranged from 50 to 85.7% depending on the study. Based on all the studies included in a systematic review from 2017, the lowest rate of requesting or receiving accommodations was in a software engineering company. Receiving accommodations. The highest rate of receiving workplace accommodations was found in various entry-level positions for young people, based on 85.7 requesting accommodation. 
One study from 2014 on the employment activities and experiences of autistic adults in Australia found that 72% of participants, 94 out of 130, were not receiving workplace accommodations or support across various job types. Ooh! One study from 2017 discovered that the majority of autistic participants, mean age 38, who were employed did not receive any job assistance, which could have been due to the high non-disclosure rates. Yeah, if you don't ask for accommodations, but also there's so much stigma when asking. Another study showed that 66%, 86 out of 130, of participants wanted to receive more autism-specific workplace supports. Although I couldn't find statistics on the number of granted versus rejected accommodations, one pattern that emerges is that received accommodations are very low when autism isn't disclosed and or when accommodations are not requested. Of course, that's obvious, but I hereby want to emphasize that you only stand a chance of being properly accommodated if you advocate for your needs. So while I do recommend taking the aforementioned potential consequences of disclosure and request for accommodations into consideration, at the same time, maybe it won't do harm to ask for what you need to be able to do the best work you can deliver without sacrificing your comfort and mental health. Um, since we've gone over a little bit of how to ask for accommodations, I will put some more resources in the description on like, there's a national website you can visit that has like a format of how to get your accommodation letter written. So I'll put those in the description as well. I X decision. Can we get some yo's? Hello. Okay. So, one second. Ain't no way. Six month resub. A new badge. Thank you, X decision. Can we get some wax decisions in chat? Thank you, Ann. Okay, that didn't leak anything. I was just checking. <laughs> I'm in an incognito tab. Thank fucking God. Okay, so... So, there, um... In the menu, their blog section has a lot more specific articles that you can feel free to deep dive in your own time but you know what i think we've learned a lot today it's time we take this silly little quiz no i shouldn't say silly <laughs> we've learned a lot today it's time we take the questionnaire so this is written by dr engelbrecht and eva silvertond the r a a d s r questionnaire i found it interesting how they called it a questionnaire because I saw a bunch of memes about this questionnaire being like, did I win or did I pass the test? But it's just a screening. There's no winning. There's no losing. It's just to see, like, if your symptoms that you currently experience do correlate with ASD. Okay, there's a whole intro before the test, so I'll just read the important ones. The Ritvo Autism Asperger Diagnostic Scale, revised, is a self-report questionnaire designed to identify autistic adults who escape diagnosis due to a subclinical level presentation. So this questionnaire is meant for those who are considering getting a diagnosis or getting an evaluation. It was like a precursor to see if I score high enough, maybe I should seriously consider getting a formal evaluation. It takes 10 to 30 minutes, 80 questions. So the original came out in 2008 and the revised came out in 2011. The RAADSR is a self-report instrument. However, the authors mentioned that a clinician might help a participant interpret items if they have difficulty understanding the question. The tests assess developmental symptoms correlating with the three DSM-5 diagnostic criteria categories. Language, social relatedness, and sensory motor, as well of, as a, as well as a fourth subscale, circumscribed interests. It consists of eighty statements, giving you four choices for each statement: true now and when I was young, true now only, true only when I was younger than sixteen, or never true. Scoring: the scoring range of the R A A D S R is zero to two hundred and forty. A score of six to five plus indicates you are likely autistic. 
as no neurotypical scored above 64 in the research. Uh-oh. <laughs> a score of less than 65. Or, yeah. A score of less than 65 means you are likely not autistic. However, note that no single test is conclusive. For more certainty, certainty we suggest taking a few other autism tests as well. So the threshold is 65, maximum is 240. Scoring. The scoring of the most statements are as follows. True now when I was young, worth 3. True now and only, worth 2. True only when I was younger, then 16, worth 1. Never true, worth 0. However, the point value is reversed for the 17 so-called normative questions. Oh, okay. Got it. Subscales. Language. The language subscale is made up of seven statements. The focus of these statements is on movie talk. Friends notice you've heard something new because you start using the word or phrase regularly. Okay, this this one is actually so bad because, like, meme culture and online culture, like, I be quoting memes all the time. So that's new. Small talk. A light conversation about unimportant things that people make during social interactions instead of topics that are actually interesting and fun to talk about. Being literal. Having challenges when what is said language does not match what is meant language. Social relatedness. The social relatedness subscale is made up of 39 statements. The focus of the statements is on mentalization, challenges with understanding what others are thinking or feeling, mutual interests, preferring to be with people with whom you share interests, outsider, being considered different, bluntness, being called rude or that you have asked embarrassing questions or pointed out when others have made an error. Dialectual reciprocity. Challenges knowing when it is your turn to talk in a conversation or on the phone. Emotional reciprocity. Difficulty knowing when a person is flirting with you. Yo! <laughs> Auditory processing issues. Challenges talking with several people at the same time. Object permanence. Not missing people when they're absent. I have like a, we did the love language quizzes a while ago, but I have like attached and detached love style. I'm like on both ends. It's kind of like fucked up. Don't date me. Anyway, maintaining relationships, challenges making or keeping friends, nonverbal communication, challenges understanding body language, mimicry or imitation, copying others' behaviors to fit in, camouflaging. Hiding your automatic behaviors to fit in with others. Sensory motor. The sensory motor subscale is made up of 20 statements. The focus of these statements is on voice volume challenges. Talking very loud, not loud enough, or significant fluctuations between the two. Voice differences. Speaking monotone like a child or in silly voices. Okay, I just watched a lot of JSC when I was younger, okay? Motor control issues. Clumsiness and being uncoordinated. Sensory. Sensory stimulation that doesn't bother others can be painful and overwhelming. The experience can differ significantly at various times and be content talk and be context dependent. You may get anxious when overstimulated. Circumscribed interests. The circumscribed interest subscale is made up of 14 statements. The focus of these statements is on details preference. Focuses on details before the big picture, but can do both. Upset when the unexpected occurs. A dislike of someone changing your routine. This does not mean that you stick to your own routine, but that you dislike someone else changing your routine. Special interests, speaking about them and having them. Average scores. The table below shows the average total scores and subscores for people taking the RAADSR, derived by autistic people, suspected autistic people, and non-autistic people, or neurotypicals. Okay, looking at the average scores, I'm not going to share my sister's score yet, but she she scored in range. <laughs> you may ask, if the threshold score is 65, and no neurotypical scored higher than 64 in the research, then why is the average neurotypical score above 80? 
The answer is how the data is being collected. The table above is based on people taking the RRADSR online, which is for research purposes starts with a question as to whether you were diagnosed with autism, suspect you're autistic or not autistic. But some people that answer the latter will, contrary to their own expectations, end up scoring in the autistic range. Due to, the, due to this misattribution, their scores get counted as neurotypical scores despite scoring in the autistic range, thus skewing the results. In other words, the average neurotypical scores, as reported by the online RAADSR on aspietext.org, are certainly too high. The average scores you will find in the research literature are more liable, given that they use genuine neurotypicals as a control group. In the article below, you can find a table with average scores. Okay, average scores. Controls had an average of 25.95. Those on the spectrum had an average of 133. Okay. Validity. The RAADSR is a reliable instrument to assist the diagnosis of autistic adults. No neurotypical who took the test scored above the autism threshold. Guys, am I going to pass? <laughs> okay. Only 3% of the autistic group did not score over 65. Test retest reliability was high, particularly for the autistic group. RAADSR validity. Sensitivity, 90-70%. Testability to identify positive results. Specific, specificity, 100%. Testability to identify negative results. Concurrent validity, 96%. Test validity compared to ADOS Model 4 SRS. Test retest reliability, 0.987. The test agreement between results of successive measurements. Age, gender, and self-expectancy of autism. Research also shows that a person's age, gender, autism diagnosis, or whether an individual considered themselves to be autistic did not impact how they understood the survey. The only relevant factor is their actual neurotype. A 2024 study shows that diagnosed autistics and undiagnosed individuals who considered themselves to be autistic rep responded to the survey in a similar way, whereas those who were unsure whether they're autistic were way more different in their responses. I'm unsure, so it, it can go either way, basically, what they're saying. And this is, um, this is the doctor talking about the test, so I'm gonna skip over that. And here we are, finally taking the RAADSR questionnaire. Let's see if my suspicions are true. Before I get into it, I personally demonstrate some signs of ASD, but they, a lot of my specific symptoms, which we might touch on later, do correlate with mental illness. Um, I experience executive dysfunction, some sensory overload, some auditory processing issues, but I also have a spinal cord condition and a neurological condition. So it's unclear if symptoms whether they be old or new. I think it's very important to remember before going into this, a lot of the autism or a lot of the ASD symptoms will be prevalent when you're younger. And I know some things were there when I'm younger, but I've developed a lot more as I've got, gotten older, as I've gotten other diagnoses. So just to preface before I start. And this is 80 questions, so buckle in. The Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> Number one, I am a sympathetic person. Sympathy means empathy, and I can I consider sympathy as like being able to feel sad. I was I'm a I was very I was a very emotional kid when I was younger. I would get sad when other people would get sad. I often use words and phrases from movies and television and conversations. Okay, that's only true now. That's because I'm on the internet like 100% of my day. 
Like, I be saying Riz, Giat, ain't no way all the time, okay? And it, it's genuinely so bad. When I was younger, I didn't consume a lot of media. And looking back, even if I did, I wasn't online. And I think online culture perpetuates that. So that's true only now. Only now. I am often surprised when others tell me I've been rude. No, I, I know when I'm rude. I know when I'm rude. <laughs> Like, there's been a few times where I've had an interaction, like, whether it be, like, in stream with chat or, like, with friends, when I, like, think back about it later, I'm like, oh, I was a bit curt. Like, in the moment, I may not realize it. Like, I may think I'm saying the right thing, but afterwards, I'm like, oh, I know I was being kind of rude there. So, I know what I'm doing, usually. If I'm mean, I'll be mean. Sometimes I talk too loudly or too softly, and I'm not aware of it. Yeah, I this is me a lot. I, I tend to like whisper like accidentally when I'm with my friends or even on stream. I, I talk really loud. I don't realize how loud I'm talking. Granted, when I'm on stream, I have a mic. So like I feel like I need to talk loud, but my volume does fluctuate in like a normal conversation. If I'm not like on, you could say it for stream. That is something that I do. I often don't know how to act in social situations. No, I know how to act. Yeah, I know how to act. I know not to take my shoes off in the store. I know not to, you know, lock the line in the grocery store. I know that. I can, quote unquote, put myself in other people's shoes. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been very empathetic. And even more prevalent now, like, consuming so much media online, consuming so much news. I Sometimes I, like, feel... Like, in my chest whenever I see something happen. I have a hard time figuring out what some phrases mean. Like, you are the apple of my eye. No, I always understood. Something that I remembered recently was, obviously, my parents knew my sister had ESD. And looking back, there were a lot of things they did good, and then some things they didn't do as good. So one of the things that was kind of an L was my sister didn't understand idioms so an idiom is like it's saying here phrases that say something but mean something entirely different so like she didn't understand the phrase when pigs could fly she really struggled with phrases like that and so what my parents did is anytime they said an idiom and my sister didn't understand they wrote it on a sticky note and put it on the fridge and they would like tease her about it which honestly huge l okay huge l don't do that shit for your parent don't do that don't make fun of your kid but I always understood idioms. I only like to talk to people who share my special interest. No, I like talking to... I like... Okay, I like listening to people talk about what they like. Like, if you have a special interest, like, info dump on me. I love listening. I focus on details rather than the overall idea. I'm not sure. It's, I don't know. Because this question makes me think of like a painting, right? You look at the whole composition first, and then you look at the details throughout. But when I'm out and about, like, I always focus on little details. Like, if I'm on the bus, I'm like hyper-focusing on the seat diagonal for me. Or if I'm in the forest, I'm looking at one leaf. Um, It depends on the context for me, but usually I look at details. I don't know if that's how I was when I was younger. I'll say true only now, because now I have like the time to focus on details. I always notice how food feels in my mouth. This is more important th to me than how it tastes. Never true. Texture is huge, but I much prefer taste over texture. Oh wait, wait, that's probably true now. I used to, I used to not like a lot of foods when I was younger. Like veggies, obviously a no no. But even now, like the okay, the big reason why I don't like veggies is the texture. Like you're literally eating grass, and I can only picture grass when I'm eating veggies. Otherwise. 
Oh, wait, it's true only when I was younger than 16. Yeah, when I was a child, it was more prevalent, but as an adult, I'm, I'll, like, guzzle anything down, I'll be honest. Uh, ladies. <laughs> I miss my best friends or family when we were apart for a long time. Yeah. I miss my friends, even though I don't have many friends. I do miss them. Like, it is, it is really cute, because I do kind of miss my sister when she goes to work. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. Sometimes I offend others by saying what I'm thinking, even if I don't mean to. This is talking about, like... Okay, okay. Like, my parents taught me, don't say something about somebody if they can't change it that day. Like, if you see a wart, don't say anything. If you see, like, a huge zit on their nose, you don't say anything. Because that'll be there tomorrow. So that's something that, like, I've had to learn. But also, like, I didn't talk a lot, a lot when I was younger. I just felt like I didn't have the need to talk. So it's not often that things, like, come out, you know? So I would say never true. I, I do hold back a lot as an adult. Granted, like, some jokes, like, don't hit. But if it's something that's obviously, like, rude to say, I don't say it. I only like to talk and think about a few things that interest me. Now, I'll, I'm going to say never true. Because, obviously, I live with my sister. And her special interest, ever since we've moved, is cats now. Literally, she'll come home. She'll chill. And she'll put on YouTube. And watch cat videos for hours. And she will only talk about cats. Which is really cute. Because, like, she really wants one. But I, I don't... I'm not like that. Like, the only thing that I can yap, yap, yap and think about all the time is streaming and YouTube. But that's, like, because it's work or a hobby. But I, I'm always down to, like, think about other things. You know what I mean? It's not like it's all that I think about. So I'm going to say never true. I'd rather go out to eat in a restaurant by myself than with someone I know. Oh, never true. I, dude, look at me. If I walk into a restaurant by myself, I'm going to be getting side-eyed like crazy. I will always find a reason to bring somebody else with me, mainly because they can pay the bill for me. I'll be honest. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be somebody else. Never true. I can easily imagine. I've been told that I'm clumsy and uncoordinated. Okay, I was a klutz when I was younger, but that's because my head was huge and I was really skinny. But now I'm clumsy. It It's like partially because like, obviously like, I'm obese or whatever. I'm also 5'2", so like, I'm, I'm very round, okay? So I think I'm bigger than I am. And it's not necessarily like a body dysmorphia thing. It's just like genuinely, I think I take up more space than I do. So because of that, like, I don't like, take as big a step as I should, or I don't, like, scoot over, or I scoot over too much. And then I trip. But then I also trip now because my, my brain condition causes vertigo, so. Like, I, I don't think it's the ASD, you know what I mean? But I, I was very klutzy when I was younger. Others consider me odd or different. Type one if you think I'm different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna say when I was younger, I think I'm definitely like more normal now, but that's because I, I I've learned how to be normal. But I was definitely like a outlier and a loner kid. Like everybody was telling me I had like a pew pew vibes. Which, we didn't have any, uh, weapons in our home. So I couldn't do that. The editor cut that out. <laughs> but I, I was very much like a loner kid. I was also the kid at resource. Or I was also the kid at recess. Who would sort the toys. Like, I was the one sorting the blocks. So, anyway. <laughs> I understand when friends need to be comforted. Yes. I've always been good about that. 
I am very sensitive to the way that my clothes feel when I touch them. How they feel is more important to me than how they look. Yes. That's why, like, I can't buy clothes online. I have to know how they feel. Like, I can wear most anything, but some textures I can't do. And also for my blankets, too. Like, I have a Sherpa, a faux Sherpa blanket. And I can only use the soft side. I can't use the white side. It's too itchy. I like to copy the way certain people speak and act. It helps me appear more normal. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you guys can, like, see how my vernacular has changed over the past few years, like, watching old streams. Like, it's so wild. Like, so much of my cadence, the verbiage I use, my vernacular, is influenced by the media I consume. And also the people I surround myself with. Like, I watch so much Ludwig and Squeaks. Like, I use their slang so much. And that's how I am with my friends, too. If they use a joke or a phrase, I will copy it. Like, I will copy body language as well. But it's not... I don't do it intentionally, I just do it. I don't do it to appear normal, I just do it. It can be very intimidating for me to talk to more than one person at the same time. Yes. It's because I want to give everybody equal attention. I can like listen to everybody talk, but I can't engage in that conversation. So yes, it's true. You know what else is true? That is time for an ad. Because guys, we're two hours on stream. So if you don't want to watch an ad, click subscribe or sub for free or prime. Do it now. Let's freaking go. Doo -doo. <clears throat> Dude, my hair is so bad today. I have to act normal to please other people and make them like me. Yeah. Yeah. This is obviously talking about masking. And I don't have like many of, from what I've observed, I don't have many of the like stims or I do, I do fiddle my hands a lot. I don't have very obvious stims. You could say that, like, the way I act and conduct myself isn't super inviting. Like, I'm very standoffish, like, if you meet me IRL, which don't. But it's... The way I act in public and in personal circumstances is very much to protect myself. And I, I do want people to like me. So yeah. Meeting new people is usually easy for me. True only now. I used to be very reserved when I was younger. Very nervous. Like I'd be the kid standing behind my mother's legs. You know very nervous talking to people. But I'm obviously like I risk now. I'm confident now. Uh, ladies. Like talking to new people is fine. Like if a stranger talks to me I'll talk back. You know. I got that riz. I get highly confused when someone interrupts me when I'm talking about something I'm very interested in. It's not that I get confused. I get more, like, annoyed, I guess. But I understand that, you know, sometimes I need to stop yapping. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, I would say never true. I don't get confused. I just get annoyed. But then I also understand that maybe they... If somebody interrupts me, then I understand that maybe they don't want to hear what I'm talking about. I'm going to say never true. It is difficult for me to understand how other people are feeling when we are talking. Never true. No, truly now. I'm a lot better at reading people now. Back when I was like middle school and elementary, I was, I was clueless. I like having a conversation with several people. For instance, or on a dinner table at school or work? No. One on one, all the way. I take things too literally, so I often miss what people are trying to say. Never true. Never true. It is very difficult for me to understand when someone is embarrassed or jealous. Never true. 
I think it's because I experienced embarrassment and jealousy like when I was young, so therefore I could understand when I when somebody else was experiencing it. Some ordinary textures that do not bother others feel very offensive when they touch my skin. Yes. Yes. I get extremely upset when the way I like to do things is suddenly changed. Yes. Oh my god. This was so prevalent in like the workplace, like working in food service, like Whenever the manager would tell you to do something a specific way, and then you do that for two weeks, and then they change it, holy shit! Like, that is, like, the worst. Or, if I find, like, a more efficient way to do something, and then they make me change that way, it's, like, so frustrating. Yeah, I don't- If it's a process, then a lot- More often than not, for me, it's, like, vessel memory. Like, even when I'm editing, I, like, I have all my keys memorized, like, I know where to click on my screen. So, anytime I rearrange my windows, it really bothers me. <laughs> so, yes, that's true. I have never wanted or needed to have what other people call an intimate relationship. Guys, I've been single for years. See, okay. I think the keyword here is never wanted or needed. It's not that, like... Uh, the way, okay, the way I interpret this is, like, seeking it out. I'm a very, like, individualistic person. Like, I'm very self-motivated. I know what I want to do. And I don't necessarily need somebody somebody by my side to do said thing. Like, when I, even when I was younger, I never wanted to get married. I never pictured having, like, a GF or BF. Yes, I've had one in the past. But it's not like I don't need that to thrive. So... Like, have, having had one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say true. It's true. What's the test? It's an ASD test. So an autism spectrum disorder test or questionnaire. Hi, Ethan. Can we get some yo's? I didn't want to put autism in the title because sometimes Twitch will, like, get mad at you and say the word is banned. <clears throat> it is difficult for me to start and stop a conversation. I need to keep going until I'm finished. <laughs> yes! Dude, I will keep yapping. Like, if I'm on a phone call with somebody, like, I will draw- I will- I will- <laughs> What's it called? I will drag out that phone call. Like, it will never end. Like, when, whenever my homie's like, hey, I gotta go, I'm like, wait, I got something else to tell you. Dude, I'm so bad at ending a conversation. But starting conversations, I'm also really bad at, like, reaching out first. Yeah, that's me. I speak with a normal rhythm. Okay, what does that mean? Well, what is normal? I don't... Okay, I don't know what's normal. Be normal. I would say never true. I've always been kind of quirky. <laughs> but like like we talked about earlier, like I follow the cadence of those I surround myself with. So I don't I don't think that's normal. <laughs> the same sound, color, or texture can suddenly change from very sensitive to very dull. I think this is talking about dissociation. I don't I don't know what this one means exactly. I guess where something like is bothering you and then it stops bothering you. Uh I'm going to say never true. If something bothers me, it, it sticks. The phrase, I've got you under my skin, makes me uncomfortable. No, I know that's not what they mean. Unless they, like, want to do vor, then I would say no, sir. Sometimes the sound of a word or high-pitched noise can be painful in my ears. No. I know we jokingly say, ew, moist, ooh, but that, like, that never bothered me. That never bothered me. I'm an understanding type of person. Yeah. Yeah. But it's because, like, I'm just very passive, and that's due to, like, mental illness, so. Yay. 
I do not connect with characters in movies and cannot feel what they feel. Okay, okay. I'm indifferent about this because I can much easier empathize with people like in real life, but in TV shows, I know I know they're not real. Like it's fabricated emotion and like I don't like when things make me feel how they want me to feel. It's like it's I'm just being stubborn. <laughs> Passive is that like submissive and bright minded? Mods get them. I don't want this in the VOD. Get him. Get him. <laughs> I'm gonna say... Only true when I was younger because I'm just so stubborn now. You know what I mean? I don't like feeling. I cannot tell when someone is flirting with me. Hmm. Thank you for timing yourself out, Ethan. <laughs> I was joking. <laughs> Dude, if, if I genuinely wanted to delete a chat message, I would just delete it. I wouldn't say mods delete it. I would delete it. <laughs> okay. I cannot tell when someone is flirting with me. I, okay, I can tell. I can tell. But another problem I have is that, like, I will flirt, like, unconditionally. Like, I, I, I'm just a Riz Lord, you know? Like, I will just flirt to flirt. Because I, okay, partially because, like, I feel confident when I flirt. And then also, like, I like seeing the other person, like, be like, oh, you know what I mean? I can see in my mind in exact detail things that I'm interested in. Oh, okay. Never true. I don't have the brain that pictures things, which is kind of weird to, like, say as an artsy person, but, like, I can't visualize things in my head. Like, if I see Apple, I, I can't, like, picture an Apple. I keep lists of things that interest me, even when they have no practical use. For example, sports statistics, train schedules, calendar dates, historical facts, and dates. Okay, I used to do this. I used to do this. I used to make lists of all my toys, all the shows I like to watch, the, the characters in the shows. But I, I stopped when I started using Tumblr. And then when I turned like 17, 18, I was like, I need to stop using Tumblr. <laughs> and that's when I, I kind of stopped with like anything that could be considered a special interest. And I'm I'm unsure if it was just like me like not wanting to be childish. I'm not sure, but I, I stopped when I was older. When I feel overwhelmed by my senses, I have to isolate myself to shut them down. Yeah. There's been a few times where I get overwhelmed. There was one time I remember. I was on the bus. I was like so close to home too. I was like five minutes away from home. And I was just overwhelmed because like something bad happened in the grocery store. Like somebody was rude to me or something. And then I was just spiraling. But that was like an instance of like an anxiety attack, not necessarily like a meltdown. I, I started crying on the bus, but I was wearing a mask. So like nobody saw my tears. Hopefully nobody saw my tears. But I... Whenever I feel overwhelmed, it's mainly due to, like, mental strain, not necessarily, like, outside stimulus, like a traditional, or not, like a, like an autistic meltdown or shutdown would be. It's, I've never had an instance where I was overstimulated that I can think about. The only time where I feel the need to isolate is when I'm having, like, a, like a mental episode. I like to thought things over with my friends. Uh, yes, sir? Oh, true only now. When I was younger, I didn't share shit. Only now it's true. I cannot tell if someone is interested or bored with what I'm saying. Like I said, I'll just keep yappy, yappy, yapping. Like, I will only, like, stop talking about something if I can tell they're, like, visually, obviously uninterested. Otherwise, I'll keep talking.
It can be very hard to read someone's face, hand, and body movements when they're talking. Never true. I, I, I think it's because when I was younger, I learned what to look out for. So I've always known. The same thing, like clothes or temperatures, can feel very different to me at different times. Yes. But I think that's because, like, hormones and shit. <laughs> um, like, right now, it's, like, 60 degrees in our duplex, right? But I'm, like, freezing. I'm cold. I, I think, okay, I think this is, like, a woman thing. And, like, for example, like, sweaters like this, like, I like it. And then sometimes I hate it throughout the day. Like, yesterday I wore this and I took it off, like, three times. And I put it back on four times, you know? I feel very comfortable with dating or being in social situations with others. Uh, truly, no. Obviously, I'm not dating. Ew. It depends on the type of social situation. Like, I don't think I'd like party still. Like, I'm turning 25 and I still haven't gone to a single party. But I'm definitely more comfortable with it now as an adult. I try to be as helpful as I can when other people tell me their personal problems. Yes. True only now. I think when I was younger, I didn't really know how. So I didn't feel like I had the right to like help people. But now I'm educated. I've seen a therapist. I read articles. I'm woke. And I'm also lit. So if you need help, tell me. I have been told that I have an unusual voice. For example, flat, monotone, childish, or high-pitched. Yes. Yes, I have been told I have a very flat voice, so like I will intentionally like change my pitch to like overcompensate. But because of that, I just sound silly. Anyway, sometimes a thought or subject gets stuck in my mind, and I have to talk about it even if no one is interested. No, I will only bring up something if I'm already talking about it. Or if the other person wants to listen. I'm not gonna, like, yap, yap, yap. Like, if I wanted to do that, I would just chirp on Twitter all day. You know what I mean? I do certain things with my hands over and over again. Like, flapping, twirling sticks or strings, waving things by my eyes. I will only stim when I'm nervous. Is what I've known. Like, the pattern that I've seen with myself. I will only stim when I'm nervous. And it's only, like, little... I will clasp my hands like this... Like, it's never, I, I've never flapped. I, I don't like fidget toys. Like, my mom got me one when I was little, and I didn't like it. I think because it was too noisy, she didn't give me a good one. But even if I could buy a fidget toy now, I wouldn't use it. I like my hands. What I do do is, like, I look at my nails a lot. Like, I'll, I'll be, like, sitting here, and I'll be like, ooh, that's cute. i like, okay. I'm gonna say true now and when I was young, like, I don't have, like, the more prominent stims. Like, mine are very subtle. But I do do them when I'm nervous, so it is a self-regulating thing that I do. I've never been interested in what most of the people I know consider interesting. Yes. Dude, I'm a streamer. <laughs> like, that's as niche as you can get. I'm considered a compassionate type of person. I hope so. Smile. But yeah, I, I try to be nice. <clears throat> I get along with other people by following a set of specific rules to help me look normal. I'm going to say true because this is implying that you learned how to act and that you would act abnormal if you didn't learn like if looking back I, i'm still unsure if i masked when i was younger or not because i i grew up with a sibling who was on the spectrum so i learned a lot of what she learned i used a lot of the communication tools that she used in the home so i would say yeah because those communication tools did help me it is very difficult for me to work and function in groups. It was true when I was younger, but that's because I didn't know how to communicate. But now I'm a lot more assertive. But I've also learned how to be more assertive and I've also gained more confidence. So I think it was only difficult when I was younger because I just didn't have the want 
to communicate or was confident enough to communicate. Like, I don't think, I think that was more of a mental hurdle than like a, like a physical thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> Please, I need a hug. Oh, hi, cutie Lee. Can we get some yo's? Hello. Cutie Lee, you should take this questionnaire and see if you like get a high score. <laughs> My sister got a really high score. She got a new PB. <laughs> For context, Cutely has said she's on the spectrum, okay? Okay? <clears throat> but hi, hon. When I am talking to someone, it is hard to change the subject. If the other person does so, I can get very upset and confused. If they change the subject, I get upset and confused. I would say no, because I'm just like, what you're saying is more important than me. I would say never true. What do you mean high score? Isn't it like golf? <laughs> you want to get a low score? I mean, there's no winning. There's no passing. What is interesting, though, is that for this study, if you score below the threshold, then it's like, Basically guaranteed you don't have ASD. We'll find out today. Sometimes I have to cover my ears to block out painful noises like vacuum cleaners or people talking too much or too loudly. Okay, when I read cover my ears, I thought it le meant literally like this. But... You know, I do be wearing my headphones like a lot. Even aloud around the house. Oh, okay. I wear my headphones when I do dishes because dishes is really loud. And whenever I went to the, the comedy club, the open mic nights, like I would wear my headphones before the show because they would play the music so loud. And everybody, excuse me, everybody was so loud, like talking over the music. And when I'm walking, okay, when I'm out and about, I usually wear headphones because, like, the cars are too loud. And it's not that, like, they're too loud. It's because I'm, like, scared of the cars. Because, like, so many people die from vehicular accidents. Like, I'm not scared of the sound. I'm scared of the, the stupid people on the road. Oh, wait, it says painful noises. Okay, I would say true only now, but that's because, like, anxiety. Not for, like, sensory reasons, I don't think. Like, noises never made me feel, like, uncomfortable or pain. They just made me anxious. If anything, they make me anxious. I don't like loud noise. Um, hashtag trauma. <laughs> I can chat and make small talk with people. True only now. I'm a Rizzler now. When I was younger, I was such a pleb. But yeah, I don't mind small talk now. It Like, I can do it. I don't, like, seek it out, but... It would make me very uncomfortable when I was younger. But, like, small talk with people? Why are you trying to riz up a kid? You know what I mean? Like, sorry, the editor cut that out. <laughs> Sometimes things that should feel painful are not. For instance, when I hurt myself, I burned my hand on the stove. Interesting, interesting fact. When I was younger, like a little kid, I used to say I had a high pain tolerance. Like, I legit didn't feel pain. Like, it was wild. And I used to not feel pain up until, like, three years ago when I started showing symptoms for my neurological condition. But now, I feel so much pain. Like, a little prick. I'm like, oh, it hurts. Like, maybe, like, my neurons just weren't, like, firing off in my brain when I was younger. But now, now that I have chronic pain, I feel pain so much more. Than I did before. Like I have a. Where is it? I can't really see it. I have a scar on my wrist. It's shaped like an exclamation point. I got it from the roof of my oven. When I was like 12. And it literally didn't hurt. I was like oh my god I got burned. But it didn't hurt. So. Before I had my symptoms for my neurological condition. Like I didn't feel pain. That's why I'm going to say true now and when I was young. Like, now that I have chronic pain, I just feel pain all the time. So, I, I don't think that I don't think that counts. <clears throat> oh, 
When talking to someone, I have a hard time telling when it's my turn to talk or listen. I would say never true. I know when I'm supposed to talk, but it's a matter of like acting on when to know when to talk. I'm very bad about interrupting. I interrupt a lot, but it's mainly because like if I don't say what I want to say, I will forget what I'm going to say. So I know when like societal wise, I'm supposed to talk and intervene and, and interject, but I just don't act on it. <laughs> I'm considered a loner by those who know me best, yes. I, dude, I don't text anybody. I feel really bad, but it's just because, like, my social battery is so low. And, I don't know, I just got, like, so much shit going on up here, like, all the time. It's like, you don't want to hear what's going on up here. I usually speak in a normal tone. Apparently not. I don't speak normally. I like things to be exactly the same day after day and even small changes in my routines upset me. Yes. Dude. I plan out my week every week, right? And if something changes, it really bothers me. Or if somebody gets home at a different time, it bothers me. Because if something deviates from the plan, that means something's wrong or something happened. And I'm not sure if that's like a trauma response or just how I'm like wired. I don't like change at all. Like, I will do the same thing. I wake up at 6, I edit, I bike, I stream, or I edit, and then repeat. I, I don't like doing... Or if, like, somebody tries to make last-minute plans, I, I can't do it. Just because, like, mentally, I wake up for the day knowing what I have to do. So if anybody asks me, like, hey, can you do this last-minute thing for me? Or do you want to hang out tomorrow? I'm like, that's not in my plan. And I don't have, like, the mental or physical energy to do said thing. And, like, I've always been like that. I don't like flakes. I don't like last-minute changes. So, yeah. How to make friends and socialize is a mystery to me. That was only true when I was younger. I was such a... I was clueless. I was a little pleb. It calms me to spin around or to rock in a chair when I'm stressed. Um, no, I'm not a grandma. <laughs> but, no, I, I've never had any stims like this. Like, no full-body stims I had. The phrase, he wears his heart on his sleeve, does not make sense to me. Never true. I under he That means he's very kind. Also, he's maybe marrying, wearing like Markiplier merch. If I'm in a place where there are too many smells, textures to feel, noises or bright lights, I feel anxious or frightened. I'm thinking a scenario like this would be like a mall, a fair. I... Surprisingly, I never got overwhelmed in those situations. I was mainly scared of the people, because when there's more people, there's more likelihood of like a mass casualty event or like just something bad happening because there's more people. But I was never scared on the environment. I was just more scared of the people. Because, you know, I grew up in the age when like school shootings were like very common and I still have that fear. But it was not because of the like the sensory issues I got overwhelmed. I can tell when someone says one thing but means something else. Yes. You know, the master manipulator knows how to read other people too. I like to be by myself as much as I can. I would say only true when I was younger. As an adult, I like company now. Like, I love the idea of living by myself, but I know I would get lonely. Like, I'm not a super social person, but I just like knowing there's people around. I keep my thoughts stacked in my memory, like they are on filing cards, and pick out the ones I need by looking through the stack and finding the right one. Never true. I, I legit can't remember anything. And when I think of a memory, I think of an idea. I can't, like, visualize the thing that happened. I don't... My mind is not like that. Sorry, I gotta confirm my dental appointment. <clears throat> 
The same sound sometimes seems very loud or very soft, even though I know it has not changed. No. Never true. I enjoy spending time eating and talking with my family and friends. True only now. I, I was very antisocial when I was younger, but that's because, like, a uh, mental illness. <laughs> I can't tolerate things I dislike, like smells, textures, sounds, and colors. Yes, yes. If something bothers me, like, I have to either remove myself from the situation or remove said thing. Like, I cannot handle it. I can't do it. We're almost done. 74. I don't like to be hugged or held. True only when I was younger, but that's because, um, trauma. I, also my parents, like, never hugged or kissed us. So I didn't understand, like, the importance of, like, platonic touches until I became older. But now I love hugs. When I go somewhere, I have to follow a familiar route or I can get confused and upset. Now, I don't want to leak, but I usually, if I have a route I like, I stick to it. But if I have to divert from the route, I don't get upset. I just find a way to solve the problem. I would say never true. It is difficult to figure out what other people expect of me. Uh, true, when I was younger, I had a lot more difficulty understanding what people meant, like nuances to situations. But as an adult, I just anticipate that people want so many things. But I can more easily pinpoint what's the most important thing that a person needs. Ooh! I like to have close friends. Self-reporting? I would say never true. I'm very much a loner friend. Or I'm very much a loner person. I understand the importance of having those you can be vulnerable and close to. But it's not like I need it. Which sounds like really psycho to say out loud. You know what I mean? I don't need it. Because I'm at a point in my life where like I understand like what my own personal needs and wants are. And also like you can always contact a medical professional if you need somebody to rely on. Or if you feel like you genuinely have no friends. Hyper-focusing hyper on the word like. It's comforting to know that you have people that you can rely on, but I don't, like, I don't need it. To be honest, like, I have only one friend that I'm, like, very, very close to. Everybody else is, like, just casual friendships, and that's totally fine. But as long as you have one person that you can rely on, you, you should be fine. People tell me I give too much detail. Yeah. <laughs> I've been told on many occasions that I give, give a lot of unnecessary details. So, yeah. I'm often told that I ask embarrassing questions. I would say when I was younger. Now I know when to hold back. When I was younger, like, maybe something slipped. But when I was told when something was not okay to ask, I stopped. The final question. I tend to point out other people's mistakes. Yes. Dude, I am so- that's only because, like, I'm a critic and I'm a cynic and I'm a pessimist. I don't, like- I don't do it to be mean. I just- you know, I'm looking out for them. That was the final question. Let's see my final score. I'm so scared. I'm, I'm closing my eyes. <laughs> oh my god, that's so much higher than I thought it'd be. I'm not- I'm- okay, I'm- <laughs> I'm shocked. I genuinely thought I would score, like, maximum, like, an 80, okay? If the threshold is 65, I know I'm, like, a little bit, but 105? Dude, my sister's gonna laugh so much when she sees this. <laughs> okay, let's analyze. What do my scores mean? All scores of 65 or higher are indicative- 
All scores of 65 or higher are indicative of autistic traits. The higher the score, the more autistic traits you have. So I scored how much? 105. I scored 105, so that means I'm between 90 and 130. So 90 is stronger indications of autism, although non-autistics may score as high. 130. The mean score of autistic people, scoring evidence for autism. What what does that mean though? So am I am I just like a little bit spicy? Like These are other tests I can take. I think I'll I'll try these tests offline. You know, I need to do a little deep dive before I explore a bit, you know? So, my final score for the RAA DSR test is 105, which indicates that I may have ASD, which, to reiterate, we're embracing it, is not... <laughs> is not horrible like i okay i went into this figuring that obviously i have some symptoms i have some family who are on the spectrum oh, like i said earlier a lot of my symptoms correlate with um my symptoms of mental illness i have anxiety and major depressive disorder asterisk major that's on my chart like literally <laughs> so i don't know what I'm gonna do because like this year I was considering maybe I should get an evaluation but at this point in my life I'm 25 and there's obviously different levels of accommodation or resources you can get through your local and your state DSA DSHS agencies concerning ASD diagnoses I know in Washington it's cool a lot of if you have an ASD diagnosis you can get free dental care but you have to be you have to be assigned a social worker so that's kind of an L there is a lot more resources for work training. You can get classes specifically for ASD individuals. There are a lot of resources in my state. So if you have a diagnosis or are considering getting a diagnosis, see what's available in your local area. Dude, I got 105. It's okay. It's not bad. I'm just, I'm like genuinely surprised it was that high. <laughs> okay for context my sister to leak a little bit my sister was diagnosed when she was like four or five she was nonverbal up until she was four and she scored 150 i think it was 154 so she was she scored in her range my goodness you know what I'm going to download the PDF and review this with my sister because obviously maybe I need to do some self-evaluation and maybe see what resources are available to me. Okay, so... <laughs> Dude, my hair is wild. I hate it. <clears throat> Wait, what happened to my... Why am I not pink? There we go. So, that was the... R A A D S R questionnaire. I scored higher than I thought, but you know what? Today I learned a lot. I learned a few ways that I could help myself and also those who are close to me who have ASD. Once again, everybody's different. Make sure to do your own research on how to best support your own family and friends who may be on the spectrum. Because, like I said, the main takeaway is that it can be quirky and fun to think you have. A diagnosis or symptoms that could be related to ASD but at its core it's still a disability so make sure you learn the best ways to support those who are, you are close to um yeah guys I'm definitely telling this to my therapist so please make sure you're following the channel and subscribed and make sure you can watch live over on twitch twitch.tv slash peace in 17 for more funny haha -ha content even though this is like not funny Man, 105? That that's so high. Oh my god. What am I gonna do?
Okay, guys. Shit, I gotta screenshot this now. Okay. I'm screenshotting my results. <laughs> I'm also downloading the PDF. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, I downloaded the PDF. I'll look at it off stream. You, you don't you don't need to see my uh my medical documents. That's a HIPAA violation. Yeah, so that was the RADS test, everybody. Man, I learned so much about myself. <laughs> well, Oh man, should I? I'm putting my hair up. YouTube video over. Wait, am I balding? Oh. Wait, what should I do? I, okay, I was genuinely considering if I should request an evaluation, but obviously if I request an evaluation, they usually screen you for like mental disorders. Am I late? Yeah. Hi, hacker. Can we get some yos? Hello. We're gonna do calligraphy in a minute, so I'll watch the VOD. But wait, so dude, okay, but like if I request an evaluation, how would that benefit me? Cause obviously I have other disabilities, so like I'm able to get like other resources for that. And I went through the work trainings that my sister did because she got like classes and stuff because she is on the spectrum. So she was able to get like a work coach and like other resource classes because of her diagnosis. And I went with her to those classes. So like that way I could best learn how to support her. And then also I learned some work tips and tricks. That's how I know a lot about like how to request workplace accommodations. So like I know a lot. But but I think a important takeaway that, like, I've been also thinking about as well is, like, obviously I scored relatively higher, but I don't feel like the symptoms I have debilitate me. Like, a lot of them is more, like, social nuances and situations that I kind of struggle with, but it's not like it's overwhelming enough to where I can't perform my regular daily functions, like... For example, I help my sister with phone calls, like she has to pre-write scripts or I have to like sometimes be in the room with her on a phone call. That way she knows like what to say. And she also struggles with um, auditory processing. So she watches television shows with captions in movies. She'll sometimes we'll see like sometimes movies that have caption screenings because she can't like process what the people on screen are saying. So I don't have like as many symptoms as she does but like i said earlier i think i genuinely think a lot of my symptoms are related to like mental illness which l w <laughs> oh i did not think i'd score that high <laughs> I, I don't want to like say it's bad it's just, I'm, I'm like, surprised. I'm genuinely surprised. Okay, guys, let's do some calligraphy. <laughs> if you want me to write your name, all you must do is subscribe for four ninety nine, just $5. Or use your channel points. Also, reminder, um, my birthday is on Wednesday. Let's change the pin shot. Guys, my birthday's on Sunday. Or no, Wednesday. My birthday's on Wednesday. You should watch that stream. It'd be cool. Wednesday, yeah.
Anyway, did you, did you guys learn something today? Type 1. I know we did, like, education. Like, I just read the articles for, like, an hour and a half. But I, I learned some stuff today, too. Oh my god, there's two of me. Um, plan for this week is simple. Tomorrow, uh, no stream. I have to go to the dentist. And they're gonna tell me if I have to get a tooth pulled. Ooh! What is good, though, is that my tooth barely hurts. Ever since I went to the dentist, it barely has been hurting. So maybe I was just lonely and wanted, like, a touch. A <laughs> I wanted... That's obviously not what I meant. But my tooth hasn't been hurting as much, so, like, maybe it's not my wisdom tooth. Maybe it's just, like, my spine, like, fucking up. Because they did say, like, the jaw pain could be related to my spinal cord condition. Which, dude, um, that would fucking suck, though. Like, having, like, your tooth hurt all the time... Anyway, and then Wednesday, 12-hour stream, doing all the things that a 25-year-old should be doing. Uh, and uh, Thursday, probably no stream, because after a 12-hour stream, I'm going to want to rest. Friday? I don't know. I don't... We still... I still have to do peace log. Which, I don't want to do peace log. But I have to finish it. Oh yeah, guys. Also, new YouTube video. Go watch it. Click the link. Playing Pokemon Pictionary with my viewers! Go watch it now. <clears throat> Dude, I cannot wait till my sister gets home. Because, <laughs> um, every once in a while, I'll ask my sister, I'm like, do you think I'm autistic? And then she'll be like, no. And then sometimes she'll be like, yeah. And then she admitted to me, like, a week or two ago, she's like, hey, Peason, every single time you've asked me if I thought you were autistic, and then I said yes, she's like, I was lying. She's like, I would just say yes to have you stop bothering me. And I was like, what? What? Once again, thank you to It's X Decision for the six month resub. Thank you. I appreciate your continued support. I appreciate the tier one helping support the stream. Okay. Do we have anybody else who wants their name written? Any other last calls, redeemers? Do so now. The next time I'll see you guys is Wednesday, bright and early at 10 a.m. So, that's the plan. I just hope I did today well. Because I was always scared to do today's stream. Because I was talking about this with a friend a while ago. But there's a huge difference between, like, advocating and then also, like... No, sorry. Advocating is the wrong word. There's a huge difference between, like, platforming and then also advocating. 
Because advocating means you're doing something in like a positive light and meaning to bring awareness, like literally in a good light. And then platforming is just like doing the same thing, but not necessarily in a positive light. Because platforming just means more eyes on it, I guess. But I hope I did good. And if I didn't, um, unfollow, I guess. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up here for today. Thank you to anybody who watched any Chatters Lurkers. Thank you for hanging out today. I hope you learned something. I know I learned about a lot about myself. Dude, uh, the last thing I'll say is I know it may seem like I'm disappointed or that I'm like upset, but it's mainly the reason why I'm like kind of bothered a little bit is I've said this before. My sister was diagnosed when she was like four. So she got a lot of attention and care for it at a very young age. Like she was in therapy, like she got like one on one coaching and stuff all throughout her life. And obviously I demonstrated symptoms too when I was younger, but since I was normal compared to my sister and also I performed better academically, I still had a lot of like social barriers and it, it does bother me that my parents like didn't help me get proper care. That's what I was talking to my sister about. I was like, you know, like, I'm, I'm really glad that you got all the care and attention that you needed, but indirectly, I felt neglected because of that. And now knowing that I scored higher than anticipated, it's just like another indicator that I, I did experience neglect. Which, big L. It's something I've talked about on stream before. I'm not going to like deep dive into it but if you're gonna have kids like make sure you're emotionally financially ready like make sure if you do have a child who is disabled in any capacity you have to before you have a kid please understand that you you when you have a child who is disabled you are a caretaker like you have to understand that you can't choose to neglect your child because you're tired or you're working. You are a caretaker. You cannot not do that. You cannot not take care of your child. Anyway. Uh, just don't have fucking kids. Easy clap. And also advocate for birth control. Advocate for abortion rights. Advocate for bodily autonomy. Okay? Because you, you never know if an oopsie will happen or if you'll be essayed or if somebody close to you, if you aren't like AFAB or if you aren't able to have kids, like always advocate for those who still can fall under that circumstance, okay? Only have kids if you can handle it. Don't have kids because it's trendy. Don't have kids because you see your friends having kids. You, have, you truly have to understand the weight of and re the responsibility of having a child before you make that decision. If you are able to have the privilege to make that decision. Okay. That was serious. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> okay. I'm going to wrap it up here for today. I'm going to go decompress. Think about some things. Maybe text a friend. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Can we get some yo's? Hello. But yeah, if you guys want something to watch right now, new YouTube video, new YouTube video, go click the link playing Pokemon Pictionary with my chat. Very fun video. Go watch it now. And if you aren't already, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel's main channel for weekly stream highlights and the daily clips channel for funny haha <laughs> clips from stream. Go subscribe right now. It'll make my day. Um, next time I'll see you guys will be this Wednesday for my birthday. I'm turning 25. Live from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. We're doing another 12-hour stream. Will I cry this time? Watch to find out. Also, I'm going to do my nails. And by that, I mean, I'm going to paint them myself. I'm thinking... I'm thinking, like, a pastel. Like, I, I really like my pastel green. 
I don't know what I'm gonna wear. I'm probably just gonna wear normal shit. Cause like, dude, a 12 hour stream. Ooh. Okay, so I'll see you guys Wednesday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Go touch some grass. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And I'm gonna be 25, isn't that crazy? It's wild. I'm so old. Okay, final minute. Do you guys have any last words for me? oh wait i forgot to mention for stims i did have a vocal stim i used to sing to myself constantly shit maybe the score was valid <laughs> Dude, i can't <laughs> ideal mio i pro i know today was a serious stream wednesday will be full of fun okay